Welcome to the live stream for March 28th, 2018. I am your host, Dana Morningstar. Uh, this is a live stream I do every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you are new here, welcome. I am a little bit early tonight. I just figured I'd go ahead and just go on because I'm just sitting here drinking tea. <laughs> so I figure I might as well. Let's see. George is here. Tanitria is here. Renee, Karen, Jennifer, welcome. Welcome. Hello. So before I get going, and before I forget, book club is tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the book we're going to be discussing is called Emotional Blackmail by Susan Forward. Really great book. It was actually the concept in that book She's the one that coined the term fog, fear, obligation, guilt, as far as emotional manipulators go. And that concept is what I based my second book, Out of the Fog, on. So uh, interestingly enough, I, <laughs> I don't know why I didn't realize this. I had heard of the concept and I loved it. And I loved the acronym. I thought it was just so spot on, which is you know why I wrote a whole book about it. But um I hadn't read her book before. And then, of course, here I am reading it for book club thinking, you know, I probably should have read this book before I wrote a book on it. Thankfully, I liked a lot of things that she had to say in the book, but I kept thinking, I'm like, man, what if I read this book and I like really don't like it? And I wrote a book based on it. So, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking, but it worked out. So, yay, yay for that. And let me set my timer here before I forget since, okay, timer is going. Good deal. So lots of people hopping on here tonight. Kiara, hello. Dawn, Miss Grateful, Diane. Miss Grateful says, I'm going to write a book called Narsick go for it. You know, there's, I think there's such a need out there for material on this topic. And I think we are the right people to write about it because we've lived it. So I'm all in support of people writing a book. And, you know, the cool thing is in this day and age with the internet is, you know, there's no gatekeepers. So before you had to get an agent, there was all these hoops a person had to jump through in order to get published. And nowadays, Anybody can just self-publish a book on Amazon. So that's really cool that we've kind of gotten to this place. And um, yeah, so writing a book is definitely a process. And uh, for those of you that do want to write a book, just, I guess, know that. I think people tend to think that writing a book is a smooth process. And, and maybe for some people it is, but it definitely is not, is not for me. And for most of the writers in my writers group, it's not for them either. It's something that we, I think you have this book inside of you and there's just this almost compulsive drive to get it out. And that's difficult. I mean, it's a learning curve to how to get organized, how to organize your thoughts, how to uh, get some people to kind of read your book, how to find an editor, um, you know, how to do a cover, all of this stuff. But I would just encourage you, if you're thinking about writing a book, just, you don't have to have the full picture of the book and the whole writing process. Just take the next step, you know, and then the next step will appear. So just let that be said. Okay. James is here. Welcome. Okay. Let's see. And Diane says, yeah, I like that. There's no gatekeepers on book writers. It's such a game changer. You know, my grandmother was an author and she published uh, Christian children's stories back in the day. And I don't, I'd have to look, I don't know if any of her books are still around because this was, you know, a long time ago, but um, her name was Mildred Morningstar. And 
she, so she used to write Christian children's stories. And I remember being a kid and her talking, you know, I remember her writing room and I remember her talking about, you know, with editors. And this was back when people typed things on typewriters and then you mailed it off to the, to, you know, she had an agent and they'd come back to you. And it was this, this long process to actually get a book out there. And she didn't have any control over the covers of her books. And uh, it was just a really long, hard uphill battle. And we are so fortunate writers in, in this day and age to not have to go through all of that. So, okay. Tanitria says, I love what you're doing. More people still don't understand what, understand that narcissistic people are real. Yeah. I, you know, I think that they understand that they're real, but I think there's this huge disconnect of how they come across in real life and like the damn, like how, how they operate. It's very interesting. So, and I would say that that's the, also the case for a lot of people in the mental health field, you know, uh, there's this idea of, okay, these are kind of the signs and symptoms of different personality disorders. And, but it just kind of is a very, very broad brush overview of this person's manipulative. They lack empathy, they lack remorse, but there's no real talk about what the victims of these people experience. And, you know, it's, so it's one thing to understand, like, oh yeah, okay, this person, they lack empathy, they lack remorse, uh, you know, they're manipulative, they're self-absorbed, they're grandiose, you know, what have you, arrogant. Uh, but to understand like how that those behaviors play out on a day-to-day -day basis is a totally different thing. And I think that's, that's kind of the, the big gap that ne there needs to be more of a conversation around, you know? So I think that's why there needs to be, I mean, the, the good thing is I think this conversation is long overdue and a lot of people have experienced this and I think the conversation is just starting, which is exciting and kind of overwhelming all at the same time. But I think it's, you know, it's long overdue. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see where everything goes in like the next few years. Okay, let's see here. Let me scroll up and see what's going on in the chat. Rachel asks, do they have any conscience at all? How do they sleep in peace? Well, I think a person, I think when a person, that's kind of the problem with narcissism, right? Is it's all about them all the time. And if a person has that mindset that they're always right and that it's all, you know, it's kind of, they should be able to do whatever they want to do with whoever they want to do as much as they want to do it and not have any consequences. And they just have this real bratty entitled mentality, then human beings, all of us, okay. All of us need to have our belief, our thoughts and actions always need to be in alignment. And if they're not, then we experience cognitive dissonance and for narcissists and sociopaths and psychopaths, that they have to continually change their belief system to match their behaviors. And the way that they bridge that gap is, is there's this, well, there's justification of their behavior to themselves. And there's also this, you know, like ridiculous level of entitlement. So if they feel entitled to lie and cheat and steal and manipulate and use, abuse, exploit and neglect other people, then they always feel that they're right. So they're kind of like missing that part of that moral compass that says, don't do that because their mind is continually justifying their behavior. And this is where on our end, where, where we see people, when we see them uh, continuing to justify, minimize, rationalize, deny, blame, that there's no sense of sincere accountability on their end. And that's why you don't ever see their actions change for long. They just get better at hiding them. So because they get, they don't want consequences because they feel entitled to act how they, how they act. And so if a person has no 
empathy and remorse, and they also don't experience guilt because guilt is a is a big beha- is a big driver for a normal person's behavior. It lets us know what's right and what's wrong because you know we experience guilt when we do something bad, or I should say, we experience appropriate appropriate guilt when we do something bad. You know, if you do something wrong, it's normal to feel guilty about it. But if a person doesn't experience guilt, then they just, if they're just going through life kind of with that mindset of, you know, want, if I want this, I should have it kind of a thing, then that's where it gets really scary and really dangerous. And that's too, one of the reasons they can and do become dangerous and destructive and even down the road deadly because it, when they start working it up in their mind, if they're projecting all of their garbage, all of their lying, cheating, manipulating, using, abusing, exploiting onto you, onto us, right? Uh, then in their mind, they're no longer the bad. It's just the weird, the way the human brain works. Then they're no longer the bad guy than we are. So if, they're, if they can't handle that guilt of cheating, and then they're going to say, oh, I think you're, you're lying, you're cheating, you're doing this, you're doing that. They're, they know everything like kind of, you know, deeper in their brain of what they're doing, but they're putting all that garbage onto us. And then, then they're punishing us for the stuff that they're doing. It's so twisted, but I think that's really kind of what's going on. And so when things get to that point, you got to realize you're not dealing with a, you're not dealing with a reasonable, rational person. And so trying to continue to be reasonable and rational isn't going to get you anywhere. It's just going to get you further caught up in the mud because they're going to continue to twist and distort reality to suit their, you know, their twisted view of it. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. Let me scroll up. Um, cha cha cha. Bonnie is here. People are talking about cognitive dissonance, which is one of my favorite topics. I think that's just so, it's so fascinating how the human mind works and it just doesn't, so much of this stuff is going on at a subconscious level that we're not even aware of. Like we can justify things in like a split second. And we all do this on a very regular basis. So it's not just it's not, we don't just experience cognitive dissonance in abusive relationships. We experience cognitive dissonance probably every day, you know? So we're continually modifying our behavior to match our beliefs and our beliefs to match our behavior all day, every day. That has to be in alignment or then a person's acting really out of alignment, which makes us feel like we're crazy because none of us, none of us do things that we know are are against our beliefs. You know, we have to somehow be okay with that. And our brain will continue to throw out. If we really want to take that action, our brain's going to continue throwing out potential justifications that we can use to be okay with us taking that action. So for example, if I'm trying to lose weight and I'm like, man, I really want some ice cream, but I'm like, you know, but I swear I was going to go on a diet and I'm trying to cut back on my calories, if I, if my behavior is going to be, I'm going to eat ice cream, then my belief, my thought has to match that action. Belief matches behavior, thought on a more mild level, right? Thought has to match action. So if my thought is, I really want ice cream, or I should say my, if, my, if I'm going to go eat ice cream, right? I'm like, man, I really want some ice cream. I have to get those, that thought and that action in alignment. So if I'm sitting down to eat ice cream, I have to tell myself, well, something along the lines of maybe I'll work out twice as hard tomorrow. Maybe I'll skip breakfast tomorrow. Maybe I will, I'll have a small ice cream instead of a large. Like we're going to offer up these justifications and tell our brains like, okay, I'll buy that one. You know, okay, if, if you're going to get an extra small ice cream, then I guess it's okay that you have it. And then we're okay with now eating ice cream. 
but that's how that slippery slope and that descent into madness goes. So like with when we're encountering problematic behavior in others, if they do something that's concerning, right? Like they make a comment or let's say they all of a sudden they rage at you or something happens initially. If we justify that and we're like, well, they must have had a bad day. If our action is going to be that we're going to stay in that relationship, we're going to have to find a thought that supports that. And if our initial thought is, hey, it's not okay for me to be yelled at, but then somebody yells at us, then we somehow need to, to reconcile that. So we might tell ourselves, well, I bet it's because they're stressed out, or I bet it's because we have a new baby, or I bet it's because it's a full moon, or I bet it's because they're a Scorpio, or do you see what I'm saying? Like, we're going to continue to rationalize until we find something that we're like, okay, that's reasonable enough. I'll let it slide. And then it, it keeps happening and it keeps happening and we keep offering up more and more justifications. And generally until a person gets to that breaking point where they can no longer offer up justifications. And here's how other people experience this in another way. So it's the same thing with addicts or alcoholics. And this is one of the reasons, you know, they'll say like, it's important for them to hit rock bottom. It's important for them to not have enablers around them that excuse or um, are kind of you know, excuse their behavior or kind of like co-conspirators in their behavior that are buying food, buying alcohol, buying drugs, allowing them to, you know, live at home and be an alcoholic and they're 30 years old. And do you see what I'm saying? Or that they're calling in sick for them, that kind of thing. Like in order for a person to change, they have to experience pain. It's how all of us wake up. Like there has to get to that point where we're like, okay, for real, this is a problem. Because if you talk to any, anybody with a problem, they're going to initially tell you it's fine. I can handle it. And until they are, until their beliefs change of, you know what, actually, maybe this is a problem. And sometimes for like an addict or an alcoholic, it's getting a DUI or that third DUI, or it's going to jail, or it's, losing their job or it's losing their family. Like the, the stakes have to be high oftentimes in order for a person to realize, no, you can't handle this. Like this is indeed a problem, but where it gets so scary for loved ones around the addict or the alcoholic is they're like, I see this per like this person could die. I mean, they're really making terrible decisions. They don't want help. You know, they're not willing to change. And it's really hard for other people to just throw their hands up and be like, you have to hit rock bottom. Like, I can't make you change. You know, you have to realize that this is a problem because if they don't realize that it's a problem, then they're not going to do the work of changing. And that that's the other issue with, you know, narcissists and antisocial personality disordered people is if they don't realize that there's a problem, if they continue, if they have that attitude of entitlement and they continue to get away with things and there are no consequences, which is oftentimes the case, they're often surrounded by their flying monkeys and their enablers and people that justify their behavior and they blame us and they blame, and especially if we're buying into it, there's, they don't experience pain because they don't have guilt. They don't have empathy and they don't have remorse. There's zero pain experienced from their actions. All they receive is pleasure because they always get their way. And if they don't get their way, then they just, it's because of somebody else's fault. Right. So there is no introspection. There is like, Hey, maybe this isn't working for me. Maybe I should do something different. So there's, there's all of these, this kind of whirlwind of problematic thinking and mindset and behaviors. And that's why you know, if a person doesn't experience pain from their actions, if they're not motivated to change, they're not going to change. So, yeah, Ocean of Flowers says they don't even change after they get out of jail, after committing multiple, um, I don't know what that word is, homicides maybe, but they harass you even more. And that's the thing. So when things get so bad that they go to jail, it's they blame other people. Look, it's always, that's kind of the, the stereotype, the battle cry of the abuser of look at what you made me do. Look at what you made me do. If you hadn't a worn lipstick or if you hadn't have forgotten to buy ketchup at the store, or if, if that guy, something totally out of your control, if that guy didn't look at you, I wouldn't have had to hit you. I wouldn't have had to yell at you. See, this is your fault. And because they spin things around and they blame 
you because it can never be their fault because they completely lack the emotional maturity to have accountability. If it's always everybody else's fault, then that's why they feel entitled. It's a very, very immature mindset. It's the mindset of like a three-year-old, you know, like where they're totally not responsible for their behavior, you know? Um, it's like a little kid, you know, well, you know, <laughs> you know, my brother, he was crying. And so that's why I locked him in the closet or because they don't have like a, a solid moral compass, you know, it's just all in that moment. And it's, it's very much all about what they want. And they're very much reacting to their environment because they think the world should revolve around them. And as we get older, we realize that's not the case, you know, that that's not okay to lock your brother in the closet or to, you know, it's not okay if somebody forgets to buy ketchup at the store that you yell at them or that you hit them. It's, and it's for sure not okay. Like we really don't have control over other people's actions. So the guy at the restaurant, you know, was staring at you, you know, you have no control over that. And any sane person would understand that. But even if you did, like, you know, you forget to buy ketchup or you wear lipstick or you do something like that, it's still, there's never, there's never ex an excuse to, to abuse a person. It's a, okay for a person to be frustrated and upset or to experience whatever emotion that they experience. It's how they express that emotion is where it comes down to whether it's appropriate or inappropriate, you know, kind of the foundations of adult behavior. So there's that expectation of, you know, you don't go bananas if your coworker does something that you don't like. Like you, are, you need to be able to have that emotional regulation to handle things. And they don't have that. So, and that is what's so scary. So when they do start experiencing consequences, like going to jail and those kinds of things, in their mind, it's not their fault. It's all your fault. You know, you started this, you were cheating on me when they were the one cheating on you because they're projecting all their stuff. And so now they're sitting in jail and they've been stewing about it. That which she got me locked up or he got me locked up. This is all his fault or her fault. I'm going to get them. And they can become very, very dangerous very quickly, especially when consequences, when they are prevented from getting their way, if the police are called, if they do get restraining orders, if you go to leave the relationship, if they go to jail, if they get out of jail, those kinds of things, you're not dealing with a reasonable, rational, sane human being. It's really important to realize that. And they will happily, they just, there's no like real long-term thinking there either. You know, when you do hear these stories where this person freaked out and they killed their former partner, in their mind, they feel totally entitled to do that. They oftentimes think they can charm the court and and not go to jail. I mean, like Scott Peterson or, um, you know, a lot of the other people out there. I, and sometimes they can, right? Like Casey Anthony and other people like that, where it's like, you know, all the evidence points to you did this. But anyways but then they don't have consequences or if they, when they do go to jail um, and they're convicted because they feel entitled to do what they do and they're not thinking long-term it's like, I think it comes as a shock to them when they actually do have consequences, but uh, even still was serving jail time in their mind, what they did was they had to, like it was reasonable. They got, they got pushed to the edge in their mind. Okay. Claudia asks, are they such master manipulators that they believe their own deceptive thoughts? Yes. Because like I was saying earlier, people have to, you know, our thoughts always have to match our actions. This stuff happens quickly. Like we justify things. Our, everybody does this, our own thinking. It's like a split second thing. And oftentimes this, our justifications happen below our level of awareness, but I'll tell you, it's an absolute game changer. Uh, if we can bring that justification and all of that to our conscious awareness, because then we can see, okay, yeah, I'm lying to myself about something. 
you know, or it's hard, man, sitting in our own truth is a really difficult thing for anybody to do, especially, I mean, especially pathological personalities, but even for like normal people, it's really difficult for us to just be honest with ourselves. I was thinking, here's an example. I was thinking like an hour ago, I've had a gym membership for three years. Okay. I used to go on a fairly regular basis. I quit going about two years ago. I think I've gone maybe a dozen times, maybe in two years. And today I was thinking about, and I still pay, I pay that monthly fee every single month. And today I, I realized I'm like, you know, Dana, cause this is my big thing. My, it, my big thing is just being honest with myself about what's really going on. And because I lie to myself all the time, I'm like, I'll do that tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to start. It's going to be all good. To, and it's so easy for us people to slip into lying to themselves. And I, I just had this realization of like, you know what? I need to get real. I'm either going to, I need to either start going to the gym or I need to cancel that membership, but continuing to lie to myself and every single day for the past two years being like, I'll go tomorrow and then not going isn't working. <laughs> so if I want something to change, I actually need to change. Right. So it's, <sighs> yeah just being honest with ourselves. I'm the same way with stuff on my website where I'm like, yeah, totally going to do that. Totally going to, you know, get a person to help me out with my YouTube channel, or I'm going to hire somebody to do this, or I'm going to really spend more time doing X, Y, Z. And then it ends up not happening. And I continue to lie to myself and lie to myself and lie to myself. And then I don't, you know, I don't get anywhere and it's frustrating, but I don't, for the longest time, I didn't realize I was lying to myself because I believed that justification. Because as soon as we offer up that justification, it smooths over that anxiety of, man, okay, I feel really bad. I ate ice cream tonight. You know, I've been trying to lose weight. But if I lie to myself and I'm like, okay, but you know what? You can go to the gym tomorrow. And I have it all, this beautiful plan worked out in my head. But if I don't go, then it's just it's just me getting rid of that anxiety about, not going to the gym. Do you see what I'm saying? So they have every, I mean, they have the same thing. Like they're human beings too. Their brain, even though it works in a way that it's hard for us to wrap our mind around, like the basics of how they justify their behavior is the same. It's just that their behavior is a lot more extreme than what we do. Okay. Uh, Jennifer says, I was reading a news story recently about how a guy in my area went to jail for almost killing his wife, and she actually changed her name and moved because she saw strange signs Oh, that he might know. Hmm. Oh, people on the outside to pay or hurt her or kill her and her son. Good for her. I, you know, I'm a big fan. If you've gotten to the point where you're considering a restraining order against a person, I'm a bigger fan that it's a good idea just to move, put distance between you and that person because a piece of paper is not going to keep you safe. And if you're dealing with a pathological personality, it's a total wild card. And I don't mean, I'm not saying that to scare anybody. I'm saying that to try to empower you and to really take this stuff seriously. And I realize that it's not fair and it's an, it's expensive to move and it's inconvenient and all of this, but at the end of the day, you know, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do in order, in order to breathe, in order to not always be looking over your shoulder and living a life at, out of fear. Don asks, what are your thoughts on OJ? Well, I think, I think he's a huge narcissist, you know, and I, I think, wasn't he found guilty in, I know he was found innocent in what, like he had multiple court trials, but I think he was found guilty on like a personal level. And I forget, I'd have to Google it. I forget what it's even called, but uh yeah, I think there's a huge degree of arrogance, right. To write a book saying, if this is basically like, if I did it, this is how I would do it. I think all of the, you know, M and Nicole had a huge history of domestic violence with him. And he had, I think, gone to jail multiple times. There are pictures of her, you know, black and blue. And all of the signs are there. 
And I think it would just be, that's one heck of a coincidence that a total random stranger were to attack her and her boyfriend in such a vicious way. And I think too, you can kind of tell by the nature of the crime that such a personal hate fueled crime that that's not just a, a random robbery. So yeah, I have no doubt in my mind that he did it. You know, I think it's disgusting that he got away with it. Uh, Princess says, it's weird how they can trigger a compassionate side of me. They act like the victim and I feel sad for him. How can it be after he treated me so poorly? Well, I think, you know, I think a lot of us are kind of just hardwired. We feel bad when somebody starts acting sympathetic and they seem kind of like this baby bird with a broken wing. Cause we realize we're like, we're not dealing with an emotionally healthy or mature person. Like this person's obviously deeply troubled and our heart kind of goes out to them. But I think it's really important that we rein that in and realize that this is a dangerous and destructive person. Yes, they are deeply troubled, but it, that doesn't give them, it's not an excuse. It's not an excuse for abuse. And, you know, the, I, and I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was in, in the book that we're going to be discussing tomorrow where she talks about getting used to getting comfortable feeling uncomfortable as far as sitting with our own emotions. So if we're feeling guilty, if we're feeling, oh, no, he needs me or I, I can't leave him or, oh, he's sorry or I just feel bad. I mean, obviously, he's not a reasonable, rational person. He doesn't understand. And we fall into that baby bird with a broken wing kind of thing to get used to, to, we need to act, we need to respond in a healthy way. So even if our feelings are that of the guilt and pity and sympathy that we need to just sit there and get used to feeling uncomfortable, but still do the right thing, still be able to move ourselves to a place where we're safe and sane and, and out of harm's way. So then that takes practice and it's hard. It's hard to sit there and, um, hold a bunch of these uncomfortable emotions and not, it's hard to slow things down and not have that knee jerk reaction to want to jump in and fix them, fix the situation, make them okay. Um, try to smooth things over, but that's really unhealthy on our end and something that we need to work on. Uh, let's see here. Rachel says, uh, my ex is living his fairy tale. He met her off Tinder and he moved in within three months and he's flaunting it. It is so traumatic. Okay, here's the thing though, Rachel. What you're seeing is the idealized stage for the next person. This is so, so, so common. Like I would say top, top three most common things that people experience in all of this is they're like, maybe it really was me. Because boy, they moved on at light speed. They seem so happy. They're smiling. There's all these pictures of them online. They seem like this perfect fit. So maybe it was me. Maybe there's something that I could have done differently. But you're seeing the idealized stage for the next person, which also generally is a continuation of the devalue stage for you. Because if they're sadistic, especially, they know that this is really getting to you and there's nothing you can do about it. And it just twists the knife and it hurts like hell. And it also shows the world of, because they've, I mean, it's just, it's like, man, it's like falling into, it's like Alice in Wonderland or Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. Like all of a sudden you're in this crazy place and what's down is up and what's up is down and nothing makes sense. And there's this Mad Hatter's tea party kind of a thing. And you're like, what on earth is going on? I just thought we were in a relationship. This person's insane. And they've spun things around. And they've worked up this whole smear campaign against you. They've made you the bad guy. And that all of it, so you start hearing about all of this stuff and you're like, wait, what? Like that never happened. And why is this person saying these things? And it's, it's insanity. I mean, it's crazy. So don't confuse that with him changing or with him being happily living happily ever after. She'll see it too. Give it time because 
with abusive people like we were talking about, it's that very immature mentality and they have very shallow emotions and they, they, what was the last, I think it was the last book that we read talked about, they don't change. They just change targets and tactics. And I think that's very well said and it's very true. So, you know, mature, healthy adults don't move at light speed like that. They don't move in with a total stranger after three months. They don't have, there's not this whirlwind of intensity surrounding them because I'll tell you, even if they were completely healthy, you don't know a person after three months, you know? So odds are when that, when that fog of, you know, dopamine and all of those feel good chemicals leave and a person starts seeing that, that situation clearly, they're going to realize, you know what, that's really, really annoying that that person does that or man, it's going to be those little, the reality of that person is going to start coming through and with abusers because there's just, there's no real forward thought process there. They want what they want when they want it. Right. And so you jumped on that new person. And then when the reality starts settling in, he's going to do the exact same thing to her. So if he spent all this time kind of grinding you down, you know, oh, you need to, you need to not wear makeup. You need to, in everything about you that he didn't like, that he was just grinding those edges off of you to make you into his perfect partner, he will do to her. He might do it in a different way. So let's say, for example, he, you wear makeup where she doesn't, he might not get on her about wearing makeup, or he might actually encourage her to wear makeup. It's weird. It's just kind of, they're rewriting reality on the fly. So it's kind of whatever, whatever they want, I guess it just goes back to that, whatever they want in that moment, they feel entitled to get. And so they just are trying to, you know, get that foot to fit the shoe kind of a thing all the time with targets, the generally the targets in their life. But just wait. Just you wait, it'll, you'll see it come crashing down. They, it's just a predictable pattern because it's not you, it's them. And they, you know, and it's the, kind of like the old saying goes, no matter where you are, no matter where you go, there you are. And for abusive people, that's the problem. But because they don't look within and realize, hey, maybe this is me, they don't change. And if a person doesn't change, then they keep running the same pattern over and over again. And also kind of along with that on social media, if you're, especially if you're hearing, think, and just think about this, okay? If you're hearing from other people and if you're seeing stuff on social media, you're seeing a very edited, rea- very edited version of reality. We all do this, right? Like most people only put their best pictures on social media. They'll put, they'll share their vacation photos or their successes, their, or maybe some major losses in their life, but people don't really tend to talk, they don't talk openly about, things that they feel um, embarrassed or ashamed about. So you're not going to see that. You're just going to see the highlight reel of, of their life. Okay. Sunny Day says, yeah, my ex is still trying to get me arrested for getting him arrested. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. There's just zero accountability. You know, oh, the police were fooled. I didn't do anything. You know, she was real drama. She fell into the wall. I mean, I kind of, I kind of just, I just barely touched her and she fell into the wall. And and then you see the victim, you know, and has bruises or broken bones or whatever. And they're like, oh, she just, you know, did that to herself. And, you know, sure that can happen, but that happens, I would say probably less than 1% of the time. You know, more often than not, it's, you know, you're looking at a crime scene, like a legit crime scene. Okay, let's see. Um. Kiara says, hey, Dana, how do we deal with the deep feeling of lingering dread that exists? How do we heal if we still have to see our abusers periodically or deal with them or experience their wrath from time to time? Well, I would 
try to have a witness to your reality at all times. So let's say, for example, if you have a child together, I would have a neutral drop-off place like a McDonald's or someplace like that. Uh, I would, at least for the time being, until like you're more healed, I would see if somebody can go with you, family member, friend. If that can't happen, then I would encourage you to to really kind of the whole bookending concept, getting support before you go, whether it's a quick five minute text or call with a friend or family member, some sort of support person. And then, you know, getting support after you have to see them, you don't need to talk to them. So let's say if you're dropping off your child, you know, the child can get out of the car. I'm if the child's able to walk right old enough to walk, get out of the car and then the child can come over to your car. Like you don't need, you don't need to listen to any of their garbage, you know? And so I would just make it very clear. I would even turn on, I would start recording it if it's just a bunch of garbage, you know? So uh, as far as like texts and emails, I'd make it very clear with attorneys that you want a neutral third party, that they don't need to be texting or calling you unless it's regarding your child, but even still there's like third party apps and, and things that you can use that kind of can, can run as a, like a buffer to all of that garbage. It's just, it's having that witness to your reality. So if you do have to go back to court and say, you know what, I'm being continually harassed by this person and it's exhausting and I'm done and I'm not going to handle this anymore. Like I want to, I want to work towards changing custody. I want, something needs to happen you know, like this is, this is abuse and it's not okay. Then the court has something to go on. And it's holding your ground because they'll try to make you feel guilty. Oh, come on. You're so, you know, you're so drama. Like you can't just work this out. I mean, we got to get attorneys involved. That's expensive. What are you going to pay for that? You don't have any money, blah, blah, blah. They're going to push you guilt and shame and blame and all kinds of stuff. And it's totally, it's difficult to, it can be difficult to hold to your boundaries, but you, nobody needs to put up with that kind of garbage at all. And, and sometimes it might be worth revisiting kind of custody agreements and a parenting plan. And, um, you know, if they, I don't know, I'm a big fan. If, if your custody and parenting and stuff allows, and if there's abusive and manipulative abusive and manipulative to the child or in front of the child to see about moving if your court orders can allow for that. Okay. Let me scroll down here. Um, Rachel says, Dana, is it true that narcissists have a psychic connection to their victims? I, you know, that's a, that's a tough one because the logical, reasonable part of me doesn't believe in that. And, but I will tell you that I have experienced a weird connection with several different really kind of dark energy kind of people in my life. I don't, I don't know what that's about. I don't think that they can, it, I know it feels like they can read our thoughts, right? Like we think about them and then they show up. I think what's more likely going on is that we're probably thinking about them a lot. So it's more of like a selective attention kind of a thing. Sort of like if you're going to go out and um, if you decide to buy a new car, you're going to buy a red Volkswagen bug. And then all of a sudden you start seeing red Volkswagen bugs everywhere. You know, did do you have some sort of psychic connection to red Volkswagen bugs? No, it's just now that that's on your radar because it's important to you. There's a part of our the brain called the reticular activating system, and it filters out information based on what's important to us. So, and that's also a big part. And people talk about like law of attraction kind of stuff. And they're like, oh, I manifested this into my reality. I put out the intention to, to get money or to get a new TV. And then it ended up coming to me. The reality is there's so much stuff that's going on in our daily life. The human brain only processes 
it takes in a ton of information, but there's only like a very small percentage of that that actually gets up to our conscious mind. So it can seem mystical and magical when we set an intention, you know, law of attraction kind of stuff, set an intention and then it manifests. It's, it can seem like we have some sort of, you know, mystical connection there, but really it's just, it's now brought to our conscious awareness. So I think with an abusive person, there's so much trauma there and fear and all of that stuff that they're oh, it's always kind of running in the background of our mind. That's my guess. And that's a good point too. Jennifer says, and I wonder maybe that they're really good at analyzing their victim and maybe that's why it seems psychic. They're master manipulators after all. Yes. I think that's a big part of it too. And they can really play up that with a lot of mirroring and um, the intensity. It's just that sheer level of intensity, you know, especially if a person's never experienced you know, if, it, if it's your first time experiencing one of these people and they have their sights set on you, there is like that huge level of intensity where you're like, man, I've never had anybody like look at me like that or make me feel that way or be that interested in me. But what we're doing is we're confusing that level of intensity for more of like a predatory, um, you know, predatory look or predatory actions. And that's why it feels so intense because it's incredibly predatory. They want what they want. They're a hundred percent focused on their target. They're locked on target for bad or good. But yeah, it's, um, you know, they might, and they, they oftentimes like the love bombing and so they might say stuff like we have this connection. You just can't deny it. I know you feel it too. You know, nothing can tear us apart. You're mine forever. I'll do, I'll stop at no end to be with you. I know you feel the same way too. How can you deny what we have? I've never felt this way about anybody and don't tell me that you have either and all of that kind of stuff. And a normal, decent person's like, well, maybe this is somehow we have this soulmate mystical connection because they're saying all of these things and they're being so intense. But, you know, it's sort of like there's a meme that's floating around out there that I just love. It says, you know, don't confuse a soulmate for a life lesson. And there's a lot of truth to that. So don't confuse that intensity for sincerity because it's not the same thing at all. Yeah, Bonnie says they have a predatory stare with dilated pupils. It's like a lion to their prey. Yes. Oh, totally. Quentin says, is it normal for a narcissist to move on fast, even to the point of reinventing themselves and projecting a false front after they're done with you? Yes. Very much so. They tend to, you know, we, we've talked about how a lot of times if a person doesn't have healthy boundaries in terms of like us, that we tend to kind of take the shape, like a jellyfish in a jar. Like we kind of become what our, our partner needs from us. Narcissists can be very much the same way, but the intent, the, the difference is the intention is very different. So when a person that's more like on the codependent or empathic side of the spectrum kind of tends to twist themselves into an emotional pretzel for their partner. They're doing so because they want the relationship to work. A narcissist will do that in order to charm and seduce and manipulate. So it's, and it might kind of seem like the same thing, but the intentions are very different. You know, narcissist is it's all about them. Whereas for the more the codependent person, it's more of like, you know, trying to, trying to keep that relationship together. It, it, I hope that that makes sense, but yeah, they do very quickly move on and it's really weird. I, I remember I, I went on a few dates with this one guy, this was three or four years ago and I had this dark feeling about him and I, and this was, man, I tell you, I was so different back then. And it took, if you notice with my experiences, it took me a while to, to get my thinking where it is today. You know, I had to go around that mountain a few times. And one of the last mountains that I really went around, like the big mountain that I really went around was with this one guy. We went on a few dates. I had a really dark feeling about him. I couldn't pinpoint why. And he was very controlling. And 
I was, it was very intense, very, very intense. And I was just really caught up with all of that. It was almost intoxicating. And um, so one of, I remember one of like the bigger red flags for me is he had said he wasn't really on Facebook, but you know, he gave me his Facebook name and everything anyhow. And I went there and it was picture after picture. They were all radically different based on who he was around. And I just remember thinking like, that's really weird. I mean, this guy is like a social chameleon. And that was like this, that was one of the bigger red flags to me of like, who, like this guy is who other people think he is. Like he, there is no core sense of self. So yeah, that was, yikes. Okay. Let me, I need to see if I can increase my screen size here. This is either my eyes are going. Ah, much better. Oh my God. Why didn't I do this like a year ago? <laughs> this is, a, no, this is night and day different. Oh, so nice. I, ah, I can, <laughs> I can sit back and read the screen. It's not like a four point font anymore. Oh my gosh. That's so nice. Rachel says, um, you are such a blessing, Dana. Your videos have really helped me so much, but I am so crushed. I feel my soul is not even there. I am in no contact, yet I still dream about him. Well, thank you, Rachel. And I just want you to know that how you feel having dreams about him and feeling absolutely emotionally devastated and crushed is 100% normal. I, I would almost be concerned about you if you didn't feel that way. It, that's how normal that is. It, it's a, it's a normal response to a very abnormal situation. So for what whatever it's worth, how you're feeling is 100% normal. It does tend to fade in time. The, the, dream, the bad dreams, the night terrors, the real, um, a lot of people, myself included, experienced a lot of really emotionally, just very vivid dreams like emotionally vivid. And, you know, I would wake up and it was just these intense feelings of like sadness or love or loss or like a specific good time. It was, it was just, I would wake up and cry. I mean, they were so awful, but they don't last. They generally don't last forever. So, you know, right now I would just encourage you to focus on like tripling up on your self-care, being extra good to yourself right now. You know, and, and I think kind of trusting the process of healing, like you're going to heal at the rate and the pace that you're going to heal. And, you know, so your brain's already working overtime, trying to make sense of everything that happened and trying to process that and, and all of that. So, you know, the next step is for you just to be really extra good to yourself. You know, that it's good that you're here. There's a lot of support groups out there. I don't know if you're in any, but they're on Facebook, they're on the internet. You can find mine. Uh, my website's thriveafterabuse.com. There's a support group there. There's one, I have another group on Facebook, but just a word of warning. If you go to the Facebook, I have a page and a group. So make sure that you join the group because what you post on the page is open. So just kind of a heads up about that. But over time, these feelings do tend to calm down. I think just reminding yourself, you know what? These feelings, they're not always going to be this intense. They're not going to last forever. You're not forever broken. You can pick up the pieces. And you've probably heard me talk a lot about this, but the beauty in having your life blown to pieces is that you now, once with some time, okay, once you start moving forward and healing a little bit more, and you're healing and in small and big ways, every single moment of every single day. So please also realize that even though you're not consciously aware of your healing, you're still healing. It's sort of like having, a, you know, you, you get in a bad car accident and you've got broken bones and bruises and gashes and scrapes and all kinds of things. Your body's working overtime to start healing you. And, you know, we don't realize that we're healing every single day when we've been in a bad car accident and kind of one day you look down and you're like, Oh my gosh, that cuts almost healed. It's kind of the same thing with healing with emotional stuff. You know, it takes, it takes the time that it's going to take. And 
it's not, it's a, it's a process. It's not an event. It's not like one day, you know, boom, all of a sudden you're healed. It's like you're healing in little ways, big and small every single day. But the beauty of having your life blown apart is you now get to make that conscious decision of the pieces that you want to rebuild your life with. And that's a very powerful and almost kind of sacred space. I mean, very few people, it's a window of opportunity is what it really is. Very few people, except for those of us that have had our lives blown apart, ever have that opportunity to start reassembling your life piece by piece because it's difficult and it's painful and nobody would willingly do that, right? Nobody's ever going to want to be like, okay, yeah, I want to totally dismantle my whole life so I can rebuild it. You know, that's why other people don't. So there's a lot of opportunity in this space that you're in. So I guess just please realize that even though it can feel so incredibly low and so incredibly painful, there's still a lot that we can squeeze out of this experience and that we can make work for you, for your highest and greatest good. Okay, hold on. I got to... I'm going to shrink the screen down just a little bit. <laughs> like I'm not used to seeing it that big. Okay. Um, Rebecca asks, when a person breaks up because they can't get their way, then they want you back after being in a psych ward. Is it pretty common for them to try to get back with you? I think, kind of the details aside, it's common for people who want what they want and who feel entitled to get it to continue to come back to you. So I would just prepare yourself emotionally for that. And, and then that way, and if you already know ahead of time, like I'm not going there again, like I want off the crazy train. I'm not, I don't want to go around this mountain over and over and over again. You know, I don't care what's going on. This is just a toxic relationship for me for whatever reason, right? If that's your situation where you're like, you know what? I'm just done. Toxic is toxic is toxic. I don't really care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter what all's going on with them. That sounds harsh. I know. But if it's not working for you, then it's not working for you. So if you know that and they try to reopen contact, you know, then you can set up, you can block their number. You can set up those emails to go straight to spam. You can potentially move. You can um, be prepared. I would just anticipate that they're going to come back. And then that way you're prepared for it. You're not so knocked off balance if they just resurface and they're standing in your parking lot one day, you know, or in your driveway. It's like, yeah, okay. I knew this time was going to happen. Here's how I'm going to handle it right? Here's how, what I'm going to say. And I would encourage you if they do just show up like that, you just call the police and don't even, don't even engage. Just if you're, especially if you're in your car, like turn around and leave kind of a thing. If they show up at your door, banging on your door, wanting to talk, I would immediately call 911 and then just, just don't engage kind of a thing. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Kimberly says, yes, this is my second narcissist. I understand about going around that mountain. Yeah. You know, and it's one of those things like every time we go around, we're going to learn different lessons. And I think it's just difficult for normal, decent people. It's just really difficult to understand all of the different ways that they can come across. You know, it's sort of like, with people with online scams, for example, you know, at first it was people didn't, they weren't on the lookout for them. People, everybody took everybody at face value online, except for the other scammers, right? Who they knew like, Oh boy, this is prime pickings. But for normal, decent people, we just, I mean, myself included, like you took people at face value. And if they said that they were an engineer and lived in California and they were single, we believed that. And this is how people got caught up with all of those kind of like Nigerian prince scam emails. You know, I'll send, I need this money, even though it felt off, right? And it was off. And these emails seem strange and we didn't know this person, but yet they were, we were wanting to transfer all this money to us. We just 
a lot of people fell for this. And then people kind of wised up. Well, then we wised up and then the scammers wised up. And then they changed, they changed tactics, right? And so they keep leveling up. And so this is why, this is another reason I talk about focusing more on how you feel, focusing on your boundaries and focusing on your deal breakers. Because if we just talk about the red flags as far as tactics, that can help somewhat. Like it really, I think it really helps for a person to understand the concept of love bombing. Cause that's like probably the, the primary one that they use, but um, that manifests itself in a wide variety of ways. And sometimes they use intensity and in, in love bombing. Sometimes they use sympathy. Sometimes they use charm. Sometimes they use intimidation. So there's a wide variety of tactics they use, but they come across in different ways. And that, and, and I think that's why we have to kind of go around that mountain over and over again. I mean, that was, that was what it was for me is I was just, I'd have certain things were just not on my radar, you know, and that was such a huge aha for me and, and realizing, because let me just back up 20 years. Okay. So for me, you know, I dated this really dangerous, scary, crazy, total psychopath when I was in high school. And that was terrifying. And I thought it was a fluke. And, you know, for the next 10 years, I didn't date anybody like him again. I, there were, sure, there was like a handful, not even a handful, there was maybe one or two problematic people in there, but nothing even close to him. But I also dated a lot of really awesome people too. And, but then I also had a friend, my best friend in high school who was absolutely awful. And I used to joke about that being an abusive relationship because that's how it felt. Cause she was so controlling and possessive and jealous and just nuts. And it was just, it was smothering. It was awful. It didn't, it was not on my register, my radar for, and I didn't think at that time that an abusive relationship could be in a friendship. And that an abusive person, I guess, could be female either. It just wasn't really on my radar of, of things to look for. And I didn't have that clarity until really probably like a few years ago, to be honest. And so then kind of fast forward. So, you know, tw again, 20 years ago, fast forward, I crash into Jack. And then again, I thought, well, this is just a fluke because I mean, and then again, that situation was so extreme that I couldn't deny it, but it felt, I felt like a hit and run accident. So I really wasn't on the lookout for other people like him. I just thought it was a fluke. Well, then fast forward a few more years, I crash into Steve. That was the wake up call for me. That was like, okay, there is a pattern going on here. There were so many similarities between Jack and Steve that I'm like, something's going on here. I'm missing I'm misreading the situation. I'm missing pieces of the puzzle. What am I missing? And that's when I really began. And then that other guy that I was telling you about with the really dark energy, that was a few years after Steve. That thank thankfully, each time they lasted shorter and shorter periods of time. But I still was like, what is going on? And so, um, you know, kind of putting all that together, but it was because I was more and I think people do this in general, right? Like if some person caught, and I talk about this often, if some specific type of person causes you pain, if you're like, okay, well, I met that person online and they're a redhead and they're a bartender. So I'm never dating, I'm never going to date online again. And I'm never going to date redheaded bartenders again, right? Our brains are connecting the dots with the information that we have. But if we're not aware of, certain pieces of the puzzle, then we're not connecting the right dots. And I, I see, I saw this in myself and I see this time and time and time again in the support group. And so this is why I try to focus on, you know, focusing on how you feel realizing. And this was the big lesson with that one dark energy, really creepy guy was one of the ways I was going wrong is I was waiting around. I didn't feel like feeling like something was off was a valid reason to call off anything. And so I would sit around and I would wait until they basically proved me right. 
And it was, I had um, a gal at the time who said, she's like, Dana, because I was going back and forth with this. Is it me? Is it him? Do I have issues? I can't tell. I had so much anxiety. I had so much confusion. I had so much mental anguish. And people kept saying, well, you know, if you feel like something's off, it's off. But I was like, yeah, but I really want to know for sure. Like, cause it really could be me because I have PTSD and I am hypervigilant and I'm, I feel paranoid a lot, you know, or not paranoid so much, but like very suspicious <laughs> of people. And I have issues with trust and all of that. And so I was very quick to kind of like minimize other people telling me if you feel like something's off, it's off. And it, it was when somebody told me, Dana, you've seen this movie before, like you don't need to stay in the theater, like you can get up and leave. Like you don't need to wait until the very end to get up and leave. And it was just this aha moment of, oh my God, you're right. You know, that was such a game changer for me. And so that's one of the things I try to really instill here with you guys is you might feel judgmental. You might feel mean. You might feel other people might tell you, oh, this person's so nice and charming and intense and wonderful and handsome and all these things. And they they might even unintentionally try to knock you off course and say, you've got issues, you know, all of these things. Sometimes if it's making you uncomfortable, it's okay for perpetual confusion and mental anguish and having a feeling like something's off. Those are very valid reasons for things to be a deal breaker. So you don't need to wait for that person to prove you right. That's that'll, that'll change your life for real, like right there. And not just with relationships, but with friendships, with business situations, with just interacting with people in general. I think that's where so many of us go wrong as we wait. So really linking up correct cause and effect is, is huge, 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 huge. And so it's more important that you focus on you and how you're feeling and you, your deal breakers and your boundaries than it is trying to second guess their behavior. And do they really mean this? Are they trying to creep me out? What does it mean by this? But is this really love bombing or is this just kind of normal? We don't know. Like we, we can't, we could sit here all day and kind of second guess another person's behavior. And at the end of the day, we'll never know for certain. So that's a, uh, you know, that, that can be crazy making within itself. All any of us can do is to turn inward and focus on what's okay for us and then to take action accordingly. And I, my hope for you guys is to get to the place where you are so solid in yourself and so solid in your, your hopes and your dreams and your wants and your needs and your emotions and all of this stuff that you could be in a room full of well-intended people that want your best interest that totally disagree with you, but you listen to your inner self enough to be like, you know what, I've got to do what I know is nourishing for me. So, and I would encourage you to have that be your North star, have what's being nourishing for you. Cause I've mentioned, mentioned this before. Notice how I didn't say do what feels good. Because sometimes, you know, leaving an abuse, oftentimes leaving an abusive person feels really, really bad. And we crave them like you crave a drug. It's like going through heroin withdrawal because the intensity that they bring with them. So it can feel really good to think about going back to them or trying to make things work because the good times feel really good, but the bad times feel really bad. So there's a difference between things that feel good and things that actually nourish you. You know, take getting a hit of heroin might feel good, but that's not nourishing for you. Going back to an abusive person it might feel good. It might relieve some of that anxiety and the loneliness and make you feel loved and important and really intense, but it's not nourishing for you. So... Okay, let's see. Let me scroll down here. Uh, Michelle asks, how the heck do we ever trust or want to be with anyone ever again? Like, I can't even fathom another relationship. Are we just ruined? You know, I think a lot of people feel that way. I know I did too. It's very normal for people to not 
want any part of another relationship with another person for sometimes years. So I think, I guess just kind of know that that's normal. It's part of the healing process with all of it. I think the big thing with trust is, and I think that reason where we just kind of shut down and we become numb to things is it's out of it, it. Well, I think it's part of healing for starters, but I think it's also part of that numbness that we just don't want to be hurt again. You know, we're so terrified, like you said, of being hurt. So if you can flip it around, we got hurt so bad by these people for a wide variety of reasons. Okay. And in large part, it was because if you think back, there were probably your intuition was probably going crazy, screaming at you to get away. And their behavior might have also proven to you that, hey, I need to get away. And we continued to justify it. We were we were manipulated, okay? So it's, I'm not saying that any of this is your fault. Because normal, decent people, if you've never come across a personality like this, it's really easy for them to get their hooks in a person and just drag them off into the bushes. So um, I think realizing the more that you read about this, the more that you read about boundaries and deal breakers. And like I was saying, you don't need to wait until they prove you right. Like if you have a funny feeling that something's off, if you, um, you know, tr trusting your intuition and, and nipping this kind of stuff in the bud right away. And I think too, realizing that not everything is workable and not everything should be workable. So if, and that's where it goes into that deal breaker territory. So if you have that stuff kind of figured out, it takes less of, I think the burden and the fear of trusting another person because then it puts it on you. Other people are going to act how they're going to act. And all we can do is respond to that. So if they break our trust, if they hurt us again, it's sort of like, okay, then I'm going to respond to that and I'm going to leave the situation. Instead of, um, instead of what we were maybe doing before, which is like, I'm just going to hold on to hope and, and try to get through to them and triple up on my love and my communication with them and then just get dragged through hell. So we, we're going about it in a very different way. The more that you can trust yourself to stay safe, the less you'll need to trust other people to, to, to treat you with dignity and respect and to to trust the less you'll need them to behave in a certain way, I guess is what I'm saying, because they're going to behave how they're going to behave. And then we're going to respond accordingly. And we're going to go slow. We're going to go slow in the process. That was another big aha for me. And for a lot of people is this, this whole idea of, you know, we used to trust people. We used to take people at face value right away. And so now after these types of relationships, we feel really broken. We're like, I, I have a hard time trusting people. And, you know, the reality is that trust is earned with appropriate, consistent behavior over time. And the way that we were very naive, really, before just taking other people for absolutely face value, if they, and we were assigning a lot of people, I think, traits that were like us. So if they were nice, you know, we thought if they were friendly, we thought they were a friend. We were very, a lot of us were very quick to think if somebody is nice to us, that they are a nice person. If they're friendly to us, that they're a friend and they're, you know, manipulative, charming, cunning people rely on that. And so it's hard to tell. It's hard to sort out the difference between gold and fool's gold. It just takes time. And they will reveal themselves in time. So if we can move slowly and not get so emotionally invested right away and kind of treat it more of an interview, right? We're seeing, hey, yeah, I'm attracted to you. You seem like a really cool person. Let's take it slow. Let's actually get to know each other. And it's not coming from a place of fear. It's not coming from a place of like, oh, I, um, I'm scared of getting hurt again. It's coming from a place of... <coughs> I value my time, I value my energy, and I value my emotions. So I'm not going to get all emotionally invested in a person I don't know because mm -hmm. we don't know them, you know, and 
it just takes time. Like, how does this person handle stress and money and frustration? And how do they handle, how do they interact with their friends and with their parents and with your friends and with your parents? And do you see what I'm saying? Like kind of seeing the fuller picture of this person, because people these days, especially, especially with online dating can pretend to be anybody. And, and if, and going slow is just one of the biggest, the biggest things, you know, not having dates, first dates that last three hours, you know, having a first date, that's 30 minutes for coffee. It's just kind of that zero date, not even a first date. It's like a zero date where you're just, is there chemistry there? Is there enough to actually want to spend more time with this person instead of spending hours and hours and hours every night talking and texting and Skyping and calling and interacting with this person and you there's you know deep conversation people are talking about their childhood and their divorce and what they like in bed and like all kinds of stuff before they even meet the person and i will tell you that's a huge mistake and so learning to like slow things way 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 down you know and and just going at a healthy pace that's a game changer too so once we move slow, once we know that we can actually trust ourselves to leave a situation that's not healthy for us, then your trust will be, it's easier for you to trust other people because you're not putting all of your, tr- you're not putting all of your trust in them, I guess is what I'm saying. And Daniel says, yeah, I've mentioned before, but I lost a potential girlfriend by moving too fast. Uh, Quentin says, so Dana, how should you react when you realize on your first date that you're dating a narcissist? Well, okay. Regardless narcissist or not, if the person's not for you and here's, here's the thing. So I was talking about like respecting your, your energy, your time, your emotions kind of things is it's, it also works for them. So let, let me just kind of play around with your scenario a little bit. Let's assume that they're not a narcissist. Let's assume that they're a really awesome, amazing person. And, but there's just no chemistry. You know, you're just not attracted to him. And now you've spent 36 hours talking and texting and Skyping and all of this stuff and talking dirty. And do you know what I'm saying? Like moving way fast, telling them about your childhood and your divorce and all this stuff. And then you meet in person and you're like, oh my God, this is not who I thought. Like there's just no connection. There's no chemistry. Then things are super awkward. And then we feel like a jerk for, for calling things off. So this whole valuing your, your energy, your emotions, your time, it works both ways. It's respectful to you and it's respectful for them. So just let that be said, but Okay. So let's say you show up for a first date and, you know, you, let's say you, you do that, right? Like you find a person online and you're like, Hey, this, I'm really attracted to this person. I love their profile. I've talked to him on the phone. Uh, we have great chemistry on the phone. We texted back and forth a little bit. There's great chemistry there. We set up a date to just go meet for like, you know, coffee or I would really like, seriously, the shorter, the zero date, the better off you are. You go meet for coffee. And um, you were like, boy, this person is a total wackadoo. Like they, they're a narcissist. They're just ridiculous. Um, not for me. Right. With, with the zero date, it's, you're only talking 45 minutes, maybe. So you're not there for hours upon hours upon hours. That's the beauty of it. Cause you're going to know within five or 10 minutes of whether or not there's enough of a connection to want to spend more time with that person. So it's kind of like this built in a uh, way to leave a date by setting a short first date. And if you're on a longer date and you realize that person's just not for you, I would, it depends on what you're comfortable with. I mean, you could just say, you know, hey, uh, and it, I don't know, it depends on the situation. It depends on the person. It depends on a lot of different factors. But, you know, if they're really creeping you out or you're like, this person's a total wackadoo, I would just try to just get out of there. Just say, hey, you know what? It's, I feel like I'm just tired. Like I'm tired and I think I need to call it a night. 
Or if you don't feel comfortable really even saying something like that, you could just say, Hey, I got a phone call from a friend or you can, girls do this all the time. We'll have a friend call us on the date just to see how things are going. So stuff like that, you know, or I've got a long day tomorrow. I think we should kind of, you know, kind of get going just something like that. I think when you go through enough of those dates (laughs) and generally one is enough, then you learn real quick of, okay, I need to really slow things way down. And, you know, especially too, if like a guy is paying for the date for a guy, because people lie, they lie online, even if they're well-intended. It's, and it's so easy for our brains to work up this whole narrative about who this person is to like fill in the blanks. And then they show up and we're like, oh man, that person's a lot taller or shorter or fatter or skinnier or whatever, like than I thought because our brains kind of worked up this fantasy about them. So that's why I'm not a big fan of like meeting for dinner and then you're going to go to a movie and then you're going to go out for a drink. Like that's just too much. And if you know within the first 20 minutes, then it's just a bunch of weight. It's awkward. And then it's a bunch of waste of time and energy and money, you know? So just keeping things kind of light. Okay. Uh, Jennifer says, can online dating help with taking things slow though? Yeah. Well, it's, I think it's the same process, you know? So, and I think it's important for you to set the pace all the time, all of you guys, all, all of the time. It's your life. So let's say, for example, you meet a really great person. Here's, here's how I would have gone. Here's what I've learned <laughs> for what it's worth. Okay. So you see somebody's profile. You can tell a lot about a person based on their profile, the pictures they've used, how much information's filled out, those kinds of things. And if you feel like there's a connection there, then, you know, you, you message them back and forth on the computer or whatever, and then make time for a phone call, like just a 10, 20 minute phone call. You'll know a lot by talking to that person on the phone. Cause here's something else I realized there's different types of chemistry. Like you can have what you think is chemistry with another person's profile and their pictures. And you can kind of work up that whole fantasy. And then you message them through email, right? Or I guess nowadays it's more like even online instant messaging. But if there is those more of like the email back and forth, then you can kind of get a feel if there's chemistry or not based on their word choice and their spelling and their grammar. And like, you know, you just get a vibe, like if this person's for you or not. And then on the phone, it's a different type of chemistry. And then on text messages, it's even a different type of chemistry. And then in person, it's a different type of chemistry. So realizing that until you meet, you might have feelings for them, but just put those on the back burner because you don't know them. You know, so just us going super slow, but it's the same pattern. So very short phone call, a few text messages. Don't let them drag it on and on and on. Some people are married. They've got it. They've already, they're already dating somebody. They just want to flirt. They just want to have sex. Like you don't know what their intentions are for sure initially. So I would just assume that you just don't know until you start actually getting to know them. Right. So, you know, short phone call, a few text messages, you meet in person for like 30 to 45 minutes. And then, then if there's a connection, you know, then you make plans for a second date. That's a little bit longer than you, cause you still don't know them. And then you make plans for a third date. That's a little bit longer. And then you just kind of go from there. So uh, if you're meeting people, here's my other thing with online dating too. You know, it used to be, it wasn't weird for people to date long distance. I I think nowadays that's just such a terrible idea. It's so easy for people to meet other people within like a 20 minute drive that anybody that tends to be looking for people. And I know people are going to (laughs) like get upset and like, well, but no, that's not what, you know, my friends moved across country and they met online. And I'm just telling you, it's a different landscape than it used to be. So 
more often than not, people that are dating and they're like an hour or two or 10 hours away, they're cheating and it's not legit. And even if they're not cheating, even if they really are single and they live an hour away or what have you, it's really the odds of them meeting other people within like a 20 minute radius is really high. The internet is just such a game changer. So I, I just wouldn't waste your, your time, your energy on people that you're not going to see on a regular basis during the week, you know? So if they're like hours away, then it's just, it's just an added thing to consider, you know, especially if they're overseas, if they're overseas, it's, it's, you know, 9.99% of the time it's a scam. 99, I should say 99.99% of the time it's a scam. Ooh, Jennifer says, I appreciate your advice because I'm in an online relationship with somebody in another country for two and a half years now. Have you ever met them? And have you given them any money? You know, if somebody's, okay, you've met in person for a few weeks, twice now. I would just be very hesitant about that. And I definitely would be Googling them and Googling the pictures they send you. It's just, I, it, okay, good. She says, I haven't given him any money and he hasn't asked. Generally, they're, they're, they'll ask within like the first month. They, they create that whirlwind. You know, you're exactly what I want. You're so perfect. I want, I want love and honesty and I just want to be there for you. And they just move full speed ahead and they just tell a, a person everything that they want to hear. And then they start asking for money. This goes for men and women. So there's a lot of scammers out there that, that do the same thing with men. Yes. Maria says, yeah, Dana, get the phone call out of the way, but the all day, every day texting with a new person creates attachment you don't want. Yes. And that's the thing too. And this is one of the reasons that scammers do that, where there's that level of intensity. That's the whole love bombing part of it. It's, I want you to call me first thing in the morning and I want to hear your voice last thing at night. And I, I love, I just love talking to you and they just kind of real their target in and, and it's just more and more and more. And then the target starts feeling, I mean, it really does feel amazing. It's like, man, I'm so important to this other person. This is what love should be like. And the whole reason they're doing that is because people aren't going to give a total stranger money, but they will give a person a total stranger money if they feel like that total stranger is going to be their future husband or wife. So they're creating this whole narrative of like, we could be married, we could be together. If only it wasn't for this business that I had to go sell or that because I'm in the military and I'm overseas or some sort of nonsense. It's, you know, and I, they need you. There's just all, they just puppeteer. It's guilt and pity and sympathy and charm. And then kind of the latest thing has been really adding this whole level of, um, mm kind of social proof or like added credibility to their story. I think I'd mentioned this before. I had a friend of mine who continues to get caught up with online dating scammers and she just gets her heart broken time and time and time again, because she's so lonely and, you know, meets these quote unquote meets these incredibly handsome guys that are very quick to make her their whole world. And then after three or four weeks, they start asking for money. And thankfully that's kind of always been her wake up call is she realizes, okay, no. And then she's out. But, you know, one of them sent her a long stemmed red rose and she thought, and I thought the same, like, well, for sure, a scammer is not going to send a long stem red rose. Maybe this guy is legit. And that's exactly what he was trying to do. Another one put her on the phone with his adult daughter who was supposedly at the, at, you know, in university and home visiting. And the daughter was like, I just really want to talk to the woman who stole my father's heart. And he just talks all about you and blah, 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 you know? And so she thought, well, it's got to be legitimate. Like a scammer is not going to have me talk to a daughter and a scammer is not going to have another woman wouldn't scam me. Right. And you bet, you bet they will. So
Okay. Let me scroll up here. Uh, cha cha cha. Uh, people were talking about mm, what did they miss? Nudes. Yeah, Mar uh, little miss says yes. This whole unearned attachment. Yes, this false sense of attachment that we get with all of the text messages and that intensity that goes along with it. And um, Maria says yes about the nudes and says yes, for some people getting nudes is just a game they play. Yeah, and it can also be blackmail. So be very careful about, I would just say in this day and age, you need to assume that every thing that you put on the internet and anything that you send to another person is going to wind up on the internet at some point. It has the very real potential to be on the internet. So just be very careful when you're, when you're with what you're saying and what you're sending to another person. I mean, at a minimum, if you're going to send nudes to somebody, don't have your face in the picture. Don't have tattoos or defining characteristics in the picture. It's just, we live in such a strange time. I mean, I swear, <laughs> you know, Maya Angelou once said something like the world is a strange place when virtue has no longer become a virtue. And I'm not saying this from like a place of like morality or judgment. It's just, it's, we are at a weird place with technology. You know, I've got people, friends of mine on Instagram where I was like, what are you posting? You know, these sexy pictures of them in their underwear and um, all kinds of stuff. I'm like, wow, okay, that's on the internet. Like your grandkids are going to see that, you know? So it's just being in your perspective employers from here on out are going to see that. Your kids are going to see that. Your grandmother might see that. Like, just think about who is seeing this stuff. It's not just who you're it's not just posting it to Instagram or do you know what I mean? Like there's like long-term far reaching consequences for people to consider. So I think maybe a um, way to ask yourself, you know, is, is, is this, does this situation is what I'm doing <laughs> have the potential to land me on Jerry Springer or judge Judy? If the answer is yes, then don't do it. I think that's just kind of a really good fail safe. You know, is it a good idea to loan somebody $10,000? Is this going to land me on Judge Judy or Jerry Springer? Potentially, then don't do it. You know, I'm a big fan. I, you know, I don't loan money to friends. I don't loan money to family. I don't um, want people to loan money to me. You know, I like, I don't send nudes. Um, you know, just stuff like that. If, 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 if I'm experiencing a bunch of crazy behavior where it's like that perpetual confusion and that mental anguish, you know, I see this people, I used to look at Jerry Spring, people that were on like Jerry Springer, right? And I used to just think, or even this show, like even more, the show like snapped, you know, I'm like, how does a person get to that point? where they like freak out and they snap and they, they kill their significant other or now, or they're on Jerry Springer and they're involved in this craziness where now there's like three women and they're all pregnant by this one guy. And he's, a, you know, like in denial and blaming her and she's blaming the other woman. It's just this craziness. It happens slowly a little bit at a time. And it, these relationships all start off with like that perpetual confusion. And so it's like, I get it now. Like I get how people get to that point where they, they get on the show snapped or they get on Jerry Springer and, or judge Judy. And it's just a good idea. Like if things have, are like headed down that track, it's time, it's for sure time to leave. You know, that's like a million miles away from, from healthy and workable. 
Missouri Cowboy asks, is there any way that a nude picture is not just a sexual hook? I think when a person sends you a nude, unless you've, I don't, if you're like just starting dating and stuff, I mean, it's very much saying, hey, I want you to see me naked, right? So to me, the, the implied message is, hey, let's have sex. So if that's what you're into, if you're looking for a hookup, then that's what you would get. If you're looking to have a serious non-hookup relationship with somebody and they're sending you nude pictures, or they're asking for nude pictures, I think it's a mistake to think that you're actually in that they're actually looking for a deep relationship when all of their behavior points to, hey, I want to hook up. So like I said, there's no judgment here, but it's just making sure that you're you're actions that you take are in alignment with the goals that you have, whatever those goals might be. Uh, oh, that's weird. When the narc bark says, oh my God, I had this guy recently that tried to give me money for my YouTube channel so I could get a camera. And then he kept saying, will you do that for me? And I was like, WTF, I stopped talking to him and blocked. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of strangeness on the internet. I don't think I've had anything like that. Thankfully, but I've, I've also always had a camera. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Dream asks, hey, Dana, tips on dealing with a narcissistic teacher? I think it, what grade are we talking about? Are we talking like high school, college, elementary? Um, I, and kind of while you're answering that question, I would say just try to keep a witness to your experience as much as you possibly can and document because most schools, including colleges are very anti-bullying and uh, they're, they're responding to this kind of stuff a lot sooner. So if you can document it, then I would go, I would go from there. And I would, I would see if you could not take classes with that person. I, you know, like no kind of knowing what you have control over. So you don't have control over their behavior, but you do have control over how you respond to it. And, you know, just making sure that you have all of your kind of I's dotted and T's crossed as far as the work that you're turning in and, you know, in the future to see if you can just get a different instructor. Mm. Yeah, Jennifer is saying, I had a narcissistic grade eight teacher. He'd always pick on me, even though I tried to stay invisible. And Dream says, I'm, I'm afraid they will sabotage my grades. Yeah, I think... At that point, if you're in college and if you're just trying to get done at the semester, that's difficult. That's a really difficult situation. I had an awful professor when I was in college who used to hold the class hostage and he was the dean of the English department. <laughs> so like there was nobody to go to. Um, oh, he was awful. But I think, you know, just trying to fly under the radar and just getting through the class, it's and then just documenting things as much as you can and potentially recording things. You know, people talk about like recording things all the time, like, well, but in, in my state, this isn't legal or this, that, and the other. I'm a big fan in situations like this. This is war. And I'm really not concerned about legality, about stuff like this. Like if somebody's really bullying you, I think you just need to, you need to video or you need to record it without them knowing and then go to the, then go to the, proper higher ups. And if you get in trouble with it, you cross that bridge at that time. But I'm, I'm a big fan in situations like these that you kind of uh, do what you need to do and beg for forgiveness if you need to, and just play stupid or, or whatnot. But, you know, you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do to protect yourself. Dream says, yes, I've thought about recording. Yeah, I would, I would just turn your phone on use your microphone on your phone and just turn it on and just keep it on your desk or in your bag or, or what have you and 
and let them go. That's the cool thing now with the internet is we have, people have so much power because that's the kind of stuff that goes viral, you know? So you can post on there. Like if you start recording all of this stuff and you start, I I am a big fan of if somebody's bullying you and then they're going to be like, they've got an issue with you recording it or whatever. I'm a, nowadays I'm like, you know what, let's go bring it. (laughs) Like this is going on the internet and you, I'm not going to stay silent about it. So F you, you know, so I would, if it was me, I would record it and I would just kind of let the chips fall where they may. And I'd make it, I'd let the school know, you know, and be like, this is what's going on. And I, I would just document it. Like, this is what's going on. I have these people that I've notified, like, this is what this instructor does in the class. And once that stuff starts getting spread around and they don't even need to know it's you, like you can just post that stuff, you know? So. Um, Uh, cha, cha, cha. Jennifer says, speaking of deans, I found out today that the former dean of MSU sexually assaulted and harassed MSU students. Really? I did not know that. Um, and he was one of the enablers of Larry Nassar. I know that there are issues with MSU. I had a neighbor who I forget which program she was in. She was in a PhD program. We met one day just kind of on a fluke. We were both sitting out at the, well, she was sitting out at the dock and I went out to go kayak. And anyways, we got to talking and she had done an externship overseas for some PhD program at, at MSU. And she got tangled up. The guy that was running the, the professor that was running the program. Um, she just starts telling me about like her experience with this guy. He became very demanding, very, really pressuring her. Um, and she said it was just absolutely awful. And he was basically holding her, you know, her PhD hostage and things became so bad and so scary that she ended up leaving. She never finished her PhD. And so we got the talking and I, we were talking about, um, she was just was saying like how awful it was and she still has nightmares and just had a hard time trusting and it was so traumatic. And then when she went back to MSU and I told the department what was going on, they were like, yeah, we know, but you know, he gets a lot of grants through and they totally just dismissed it. And it was just a really intense conversation. I wish I could remember her name and I wish I could remember the department she was in. So there's a lot of, and I think that unfortunately is common in a lot of schools especially universities, you know, because a lot of college professors, you know, you're, they're not really there to teach. They're there to get published and they're there to raise money. They're there to get grants for the school. College is a business and it's not about, most of the time it's not about students, you know, it's about, <laughs> it gets just the most backwards, <sighs> we just have the most backwards education system. So that's disgusting to me. The whole Larry Nassar thing, I think everybody even remotely involved in that needs to go to jail. I just find it absolutely like how like shame on you, you know, like it just absolutely disgusts me that they let that continue for as long as they did. And I hope, frankly, I hope they all rot in hell. I think it's just beyond disgusting that they let that go on. There's just no, there's no way, shape or form that that's okay. <sighs> Maria is talking about money. She says, Dana, yes, I'm no one's bank ever. My middle name is not ATM. Thanks. Yep. I think that's um, a big thing. Like, you know, just having and kind of knowing what you're going to say ahead of time about stuff like that to people. If they ask, just being like, you know what? It just changes. I don't want to ruin our relationship. I don't want things to get awkward if we loan or borrow money or I just don't, Hey, I don't loan money to friends or family. Like it's just my new rule. That's probably one of the most common things I've seen with the biggest strains on relationships is when, especially if a person in a relationship, if they loan, if one person's giving their family or other people money 
and the other spouse is not okay with that. I think, you know, obviously when you're in a relationship, you're running a three-legged race. And so it's really important for both people to be on the same page with that. And I think for people, if you've got one person that has a really hard time saying no, and they fall into that and they've got a really pushy parent or pushy friend or pushy sibling who's like, Hey, you know, family's forever. And I, Hey, my heater went out and I really need 1500 bucks. And, you know, after everything I've done for you and they're just pushing and pushing and pushing. And it's really difficult for sometimes for people to say no, but if you can, it's important for people to be a united front on that and just be like, Hey, you know, as a couple, we decided that we don't, this is, you know, we don't loan money to friends and family. So you just have, and that's not just with money, but like having a phrase like that with different things. So you're not knocked off balance and and just slide into saying yes. So you have this idea of, okay, how are we, how am I going to handle this? Especially if this situation continues to happen. Right. So Okay. Rachel says, how about if your boss at work is a narcissist, narcissistic female and excluded you from your team and she is in power and she knows and, and even acts more passive aggressively. Oh, you know, it's difficult. I am a fan of kind of focusing on what we have control over and there are certain situations out there where if you have a boss, any, I'm a big, a big fan, any situation that's con- causing you mental anguish, especially is one that you really need to work to get out of ASAP. It's not worth your safety, your sanity, safety, or your sanity to be in. And anything that's causing damage to your mental health, it's not worth being in. So if you're in a really just intolerable kind of situation like that, where your boss is making your life a living hell, I think sometimes like that, it's worth just looking for another job. You know, your boss isn't going to change. I mean, you can try going to HR, you can try doing these things, but it's, if it's her personality, then sometimes it's, it's worth going. So I, when I was in nursing school, there were, man, I three. Yes, two, well, two, two for sure. Nurses, instructors who were absolutely horrible, who made everybody's life a living hell. And it was intolerable. People were crying. We, there was so much anxiety because with nursing school, there's generally a wait list and you have to have, you know, I had to have, I had a 4.0 to get in. I, you have to have your grade. You can't get below, I think it was like a 78 on any exam or you're out. There were all these criteria. Like if you do this, you're out. If you do that, you're out. I mean, it was just so incredibly strict and so anxiety inducing. And so people knew that you know, if you got kicked out of the program or if you left the program, it could take you another five years to get into another program. And so these two horrid women had everybody kind of wrapped around their finger and it was so stressful. And when I got out of that program, I was so angry. I was so incredibly angry at how I'd been treated and how I felt like I was forced to be treated because I didn't want to start all the way over again and be on a wait list at another school. I the best thing that came out of that nursing program was I vowed to myself that I will never again be treated like that. I don't care. It was not worth it. It was not worth the mental stress and anguish of going through that. And so the good the good part of that is and I've only ever really been in one other situation since then that caused me that much mental anguish and I I I hung in there for about 3 weeks kind of thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Losing sleep, crying, you know, not eating, just, you know, just kind of wringing my, my hands. I just was so upset over things, trying to figure out how to make things better. And I finally just realized I promised myself I would, it would never be worth being treated like this again. And I put in my two weeks notice and I don't regret it at all. I was so proud of myself for walking away and some other people might look at that and be like, well, but you should have addressed this and you should have fought this and you should have done this and you should have done that. And I'm like, you know, sometimes I think you got to know, it's like that song, the gambler, like you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. 
need to know when to walk away and when to run. That's life, you know? So you just got to kind of know what you have control over and what you don't have control over and know where your deal breakers are. So... Okay. Yes, Maria, that's such a great point. She says, when I was at my lowest in a romantic relationship, I turned to dating advice, but I needed to turn towards working on childhood deep issues. Now I view those videos through a different lens. Sister, I hear you. I, oh my gosh. Yes, 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 yes. And I see all this stuff on YouTube all the time. And I think the exact same thing of like, oh my God, so many of these videos are like how to win your man back or how to get her to notice you or how to win back your ex. And I see that now through a very different lens. And I'm like, mm, that's not the issue. There's other, there's other deeper issues here, especially when they're talking about like tumultuous relationships and, and I can, you know, you see it, like once you see it, you see it. Right. And you, these people are talking about, Oh, I've, I have a soulmate connection with my ex. My, I feel emotionally, there's certain keywords that people tend to use where I read that. And I'm like, Ooh, this is emotional abuse. You know, soulmate. I feel emotionally devastated. I just can't move on. This happened out of nowhere. I don't know what I did wrong or, um, I feel like I'm to blame, uh, you know, though, those kinds of words are not used in a normal breakup and you know, people are looking for answers and, you know, he's or like, they've moved on to the next person and they, they seem so happy. What's wrong with me? It must be me. This kind of stuff to, like right away. I'm like, okay, this is more likely than not. This is what's going on in this situation. And, learning how to get your ex back, learning how to twist yourself into a, a better emotional pretzel, learning how to walk on eggshells, learning how to style your hair differently or wear different clothes or learn better pickup lines isn't going to get you what you're seeking, right? Worst case scenario, it gets you your ex back. So, which is what you don't want. But if people are confusing this intensity with love, then they're, then they're, caught up in that because that faulty thinking they're caught up in that cycle. So, uh, but yeah, I agree. I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people go to the doctor because they have anxiety and depression, not realizing that it's generally due to, uh, some sort of really toxic situation and then kind of following that bunny trail, it, then that goes into the deeper childhood issues. And so they start, what do they start doing? What do we all start doing, right? Start taking pills for anxiety and depression. And then it turns out, why do I still have it? Why do I still have it? Take more and more medication. We, we, we start meditating, take up yoga. We join a gym and then never go. <laughs> like we do all these things to try to make ourselves feel better. And it, it's, it, it's like that saying goes, you know, if you're, if you're experiencing anxiety and depression, look around you, there's a very solid chance you're surrounded by, by narcissists. And there's a lot of truth to that. So people tend to go to the doctor for anxiety and depression when there's generally deeper emotional stuff going on that, that they don't realize and that the doctor doesn't realize. And then uh, their marriage is falling apart. They might go and they might go talk to a therapist, but again, even if they're if they don't know what's going on, they're not going to be able to articulate it effectively enough for a therapist to potentially pick up on it or for them to pick up on it right away. And so then the therapist might say like, Hey, start working towards communication and all of these things, which unintentionally gaslights the person and kind of teaches them to twist themselves in, into a better emotional pretzel. If that therapist is trying to get them to save their relationship, because and I get it, right? If that person goes in there like, man, I'm having all these issues in my relationship. I really want to work on them, but they're not expressing things in a way that the therapist is picking up on. This is emotional abuse. Then they're working towards the wrong goal. And then it's even worse if then they get into couples therapy and now they're starting to work on the relationship. And so people, I think it's very common. People start reading all these self-help books about trying to fix themselves. I mean, how do I change? 
right? My partner tells me I'm forgetful and that I'm jealous and that I'm paranoid and anxious and depressed and unhinged and needy and all these things. So I need to change. And then, but we're not dealing with the, you know, the real issue at hand. So Yep. Gigi says, Dana, this is so my story. My narcissist used it to his advantage. My craziness was trauma from abuse. That's a big one because when people have been abused, the vast majority of time, they're not aware of it unless there's physical abuse involved. And even then they often tie, it oftentimes takes extreme physical abuse for a person to admit that, okay, it's indeed a problem. If a person just shoves a person once, or if they kick them or they throw something at them, it's easy for people to justify that of being like, oh, it's just the heat of the moment, or that's just how we fight. Instead of thinking like, no, that's, I'm actually in a, a, an abusive relationship. And so it's even harder for a person to see it if it's, if it's words and if it's psychological manipulation, and if it's, you know, the gaslighting and all of these other Sorry, I'm falling off my chair here. All these other things going on. And so they're so f- frazzled by the time they actually do reach out to get help. And I can relate. I mean, when this was with me and even with Jack, it was just, well, it, with the first relationship 20 years earlier, um, I felt like I was being drama. And I because I didn't have that concrete proof. You know, it was just, it didn't match my idea of what stalking and what an abusive relationship was. And it didn't match other people's either. And so I just suffered in silence for a very long time and just thought that I was making a big deal out of nothing because other people were telling me that that's what I was doing. And it wasn't until I began working for a domestic violence agency, fast forward 20 years, that I was watching these training videos and I'm like, oh my God, that's that's what I went through. That's how I felt. That was what was going on. And it was just really intense. So yeah, it's very common for a person to not know what they went through. And then they, they get into a doctor's office or a therapist's office and they come across as a really highly volatile, anxious, unhinged mess where the abuser is cool, calm, and collected. And yeah. And if a person's not familiar with that, the signs of abuse and how it looks for the victim, then they uh, they are like, yeah, I mean, this person that's an emotional wreck, they're the problem, obviously. Like, look how unstable they are. And they're not. Okay. Luna Moon says, how can I get my father to stop emotionally abusing my mother and work on himself? My dad literally has been with my mom for 22 years. I am 22 years old. I need help. Can he change? So I think, Luna, one of the hardest things in life is to fully understand what we have control over. And all we have control over is ourselves. So your mother can't change your father. You can't change your father. Only your father can change your father. And if he doesn't, if he's been doing this for 22 years and he doesn't have any accountability and he has no desire to stop and then he's not going to change. So at that point, then your mom is going to have to do something different. And if she's not willing to do anything different, and this is the, this is the dance that goes on between the abusive person and their target. And this is, you know, the hard part for a target of abuse or a partner of an abusive person is in their mind, they're like, well, I shouldn't have to do anything different. They just need to stop. But the problem is they're not going to stop. So all we ever have control over is ourselves. So even though it's not right and it's not fair, we have to be the ones to take a different action. Setting boundaries, you know, um, leaving, doing something different in order to tell them, to send the message, I will not tolerate this anymore. But the scary thing with abusive people is they don't respond well to boundaries because they want what they want and they feel entitled to treat other people the way that they do. So it's hard for a target of an abusive person to set boundaries 
when they're when things are have already been going on for that long. It's sort of like if a parent and this is maybe this is the closest analogy I can come and I'm not trying to blame your mother at all by any stretch, but it's like if a parent doesn't set boundaries with a child ever. That child's going to be literally spoiled rotten, right? That child just becomes rotten and they become demanding and insistent and just totally out of control. If the parent then starts trying to set boundaries with that child when they're 17, it's not going to go over well. The child's really going to escalate and they're going to become even more out of control and potentially violent because they feel entitled because they're spoiled rotten. It's kind of the same thing with abusive people. So trying to set boundaries this far downstream is really hard to do. It's uncomfortable for the target and it potentially dangerous for the target and it does not go over well with the abusive person. And it's hard. It's hard. I would imagine, right? Like it's hard being their child and watching all of this unfold and being like, my mom needs help. My dad needs, you know, really needs help. Like his behavior needs to change. I can't handle this. I'm concerned about her. This is stressing me out it's hard to kind of break away and be like, okay, I can only control what I can control. And I wish my mom would leave or I wish that she would, you know, and it's so hard to even say like setting boundaries because it's so, so much more than that, you know, but like all we have control over is ourselves. <coughs> um, there's groups out there that I think can be really helpful called, well, there's Al-Anon groups and then there's CODA groups. Those are both free and they do tend to talk. I don't, although I will say like, it's pretty much the the biggest free resource out there, but I'm not really a huge fan of them because I do feel, I, I have kind of my own issues with 12 step um, program. I don't believe that we're powerless over situations and I don't believe that, um, I don't know. I have some issues, but uh, I feel like if you can take, if you can take what helps, you know, hold on to what helps, let the rest go, then it can be good. But um, yeah. So I guess just learning, learning to really embrace like what we have control over is, is huge. It'll, it'll set you free. So are you familiar? Well, I guess I don't need to draw it. There's a concept. It's called the drama triangle and that maybe can sound minimizing or, but maybe a better way to call it is like the, the triangle of dysfunction maybe is a better way to describe that. And there's, you know, it's a triangle. So there's three sides and in that triangle, you have persecutor or victimizer. Okay. Persecutor, victim, rescuer. And when a person is playing, and most people, if they're in this triangle, they slide around to these different roles. So sometimes they might be the the, vic- the abuser, sometimes they might be the victim, and sometimes they might be the rescuer. And for dysfunctional families, that drama triangle, it's that's how people tend to relate. So in that situation, you know, you've got your mom, who's the victim. She's being victimized. You've got your dad who's the abuser and you've got you who's trying to do the rescuing. And the problem with that is why none of it works is nobody's, nobody has the accountability that they need and control over. There's a lot of blurred boundaries going on. Okay. And so when we don't have like solid boundaries and knowing like, okay, this is what I'm accountable for. This is what I'm appropriately accountable for realizing we can't rescue other people. They have to help themselves. It just, I wish it worked that way, but it doesn't like they have to help themselves. And so breaking free from that and being like, okay, I'm not going to be a victimizer or a victim or a rescuer. Like I'm stepping outside of the triangle. And then getting outside of that triangle involves just having that appropriate level of what you're responsible for. And it can be very, very difficult because, you know, there's, if you're used to being in that triangle and you're used to playing the role of rescuer and, you know, stuff goes down when your mom calls you and then you get all upset at your dad and then your dad gets upset at you. It's just, 
people are just sliding around that triangle. And the only way to, to get out of it is just to be like, I, you know, like I'm, I can help, but only from a place of empowerment. You know, does that make sense? There's a difference there. So I'm not trying to rescue anybody, but I can help empower. Like I can give tools and I can give resources and I can give, you know, my opinion if it's asked for, but then I'm staying out of it and I'm going to focus on what I have control over, which is me and my life. Yeah. And she says, my mom has actually started abusing me emotionally as well. And you're right. I need to only worry about me. It's, we only have control over ourselves. And that's very common too, for it's sort of like a person, if they, they get yelled at by their boss at work and they feel powerless to, to deal with that situation at work, then they come home and then they yell at their kids or they kick their dog. So they're taking it out on somebody that's safe, that they can take it out on. Very common for an abusive, abused situation where that person that's abused, because that person that's being abused has all of this pent up frustration, which over time grows into hostility because they feel trapped because they're like, I can't, I can't express, I can't, I can't have that open, honest, sincere solutions oriented communication with this abusive person. They'll just keep abusing me. But instead of then having deal breakers and, and being like, okay, then I need to leave. Like if the situation's not, if there's no solution in sight and it's only getting worse and not getting better, or if it's even staying the same and there's no solution in sight, if they're not going to change, then I need to, I need to change, which means generally I need to leave. But if that person's not willing to leave, all of that frustration grows and it comes out in a way that's safer for them. So very, very common. And yeah, I, I would encourage you if it's just, you know, a bunch of craziness and you're like, okay, I can't handle this. And I don't, I'm not going to sit here and get abused. I need to get out of here, you know, then go for it. But I think one of the reasons that targets tend to stay for as long as they do is because they're like, I don't have the problem. Like this abusive person has the problem. And in large part, they're right. That abusive person does have the problem, but then it comes down to, well, they're not changing. So then what? So then what are we going to do? Because we only have control over us. So then what are we going to do? But yeah, it's just, it's very frustrating. Luna says, it just sucks to leave my family. They're all I have you know, though, sometimes getting distance and moving out if you're 22, okay, like you're going to move out at some point, right? So if, if you're moving out and you're moving on with your life and you're, you're doing your own thing, sometimes getting that distance can really help to diffuse the situation. So I'm not even saying that you have to cut off contact with them. I mean, that's only a decision that you can make. But if you move out into your own place and you get your own space, then you can see them on your terms. You know, you're setting the pace. So you're like, boy, mom and dad, I'd really love to come see you. Um, you know, I, I'll see you once a week or once a month, or I'm going to talk to you on the phone. You're, you're kind of navigating what you can handle in all of this. And only you can kind of gauge that. And you'll kind of know based on how you feel. So if you're still feeling all of this mental anguish and there's all of this, you're draining your energy and it's all of this, this, this energy and time and stress and all of this stuff, then that's a sign, okay, I need to scale back. So maybe I can't talk to my mom every day, but maybe I can talk to her twice a week or once a week or once every other week. Like you've got to kind of figure out, okay, where is your line for all of this? And You'll find, you'll, you know, if you, if you tune into that, you'll eventually find the balance, but a lot of it's learning to say no and, and just kind of stepping away. And so then if your mom's calling you, oh, your father, I can't handle this anymore, blah, 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 realizing that you don't need to be the rescuer. Like you don't need to, it's, and it's not going to work. 
That's the big thing. It's not going to work because she has to want to change. She has to want to do something different. So if she's calling you and saying, oh, your father, this and your father, that, and I don't know if I can handle it, blah, blah, blah. You can change that, that pattern with her and say, you know what, mom, this sounds like pretty major stuff. You know, have you tried speaking with a therapist or have you tried going to some support groups and realizing that that's not your responsibility to fix their marriage. And even it just, and it wouldn't work anyhow. So there's no point in even trying because it's not within your control. All you have control over is you. And Luna says, I, yeah, I see. She says, a space is something I need. Anxiety will be an issue, but I will work on it. Therapy is definitely needed, but then the therapist may not believe me. I think a therapist is more inclined to believe or to understand uh, a dysfunctional relationship, like, like a home environment like that. I think that's kind of maybe more, a little bit more easy to spot, but you know, if you're going, if you're talking to different therapists, I would encourage you when you initially call them, say, Hey, this is what I'd like some support with, or this is what I'm dealing with. My father's abusive and my mother's staying and it's really stressing me out. Is this something that you feel that you can help with? And then you'll know. And if you do decide, and I think too, if you do decide, whatever you decide, there is no, only you have the answers for this. Okay. So if you do decide to, to limit your contact or to go low contact or to go no contact or whatever you decide, it's very important that you have a therapist that supports that because there's quite a few therapists out there that have that really toxic belief that family is forever and that communication solves at all and that everybody should stay in contact with everybody else. And that's really damaging, destructive, and frankly, negligent thinking on a part of a therapist, if they're pushing you into continuing contact when you don't want it, when you want to limit or cut contact. So just know that, um, you know, and I think if a familiar, if a therapist is familiar with the dynamics of abuse, they'll under, they'll understand, but just in case down the road, if that does come up and they're feeding you the garbage of families forever. And, but yeah, it's your mom and that kind of stuff, or yeah, it's your dad, that it's okay to do only you need to, you need to decide that where your boundaries are and where your limits are. And kind of like what I was talking about before, my whole goal for all of you guys is for you. If you come across, cause man, I tell you that well-intended advice, the well-intended bad advice can really slide under the radar. And it's the, it's the most insidious type of advice. If it's coming from somebody that you trust, like a friend or a family member that seems like they're really on your side or a therapist, a therapist that maybe you have a door and they have a ton of really great wisdom, but they have that one belief that, you know, family is forever kind of a thing. So I, you know, my goal, my hope for you guys is that you can be in a room full of people that disagree with whatever you want to do, but that you can stand strong enough and be grounded enough to be like, you know what, but I feel like this is what I need to do. And then you take action based on what you need to do. And that same goes for my advice too. So if I'm saying stuff to you that, that does not resonate with you and you're like, you know, I think I need to try it this way instead, or I think I need to do something different. That's what you need to follow. So turn inward, turn inward and find, follow, follow your peace, follow your peace. What do you have peace about? What is the direction that you need to head in? What is, what brings sanity and safety into your life? That's the direction. Yes. Well said, Maria. And she says, yes, you have, you have, you learn yourself through trial and error. So true. Healthy tools have to be practiced and you will see what works and what's comfortable and what brings you peace. I, she says, I learned this. I learned more from low contact than no contact. And yeah, you will learn it's trial and error. It's an, it's, it's, it's this continual, like re-examining what worked and what didn't work and why and how can I readjust my approach? And here's what's interesting is that might seem very overwhelming. Like, boy, that's a lot of things I need to think about. 
the reality is you're, you've already been doing all of this stuff anyhow. It's just been at a more subconscious level. So now it's bubbling up to your awareness and now you're going to be a lot more aware, <laughs> I guess, of the actions that you're taking. So now it's just, it's, you're a lot more conscious of, okay, does this work and does this not work? And, and you'll know, like if you leave your parents' house and you feel the need where you're just, blah, like you just got to call a friend and just go vomit all over them, about everything that your dad just did. And I can't be frustrated with your mom and it's getting you all upset and you're just talking about it. And cause that's a big sign of, of a toxic environment is it's like, we feel the need to like vomit. Up. It's like being poisoned. Like you feel the need to vomit it all up. And so that's a sign. Okay. Then I need to do something different. Maybe next time you don't go over there for four hours, maybe you spend two hours or maybe if your mom brings up a certain conversation, you just kind of nip that in the bud and like you redirect, you know, it's just, it's once you realize what you have control over, it's such a game changer. And that's probably one of the hardest lessons for all of us to learn in life. Cause we want to just drag other people into the light and just say, dad, wake up. Don't you see what you're doing and own your behavior and you need to change and mom and you need to change too. And, and then we're wearing ourselves out and making ourselves sick, trying to fix them and rescue them. And, and, but once we realize, you know what, this is how they are and this is how they're going to be. And if they ever change, it'll be because they want to, it just sets you free. It just really sets you free. And then just kind of managing going with the flow of like, okay, this is working for me. This is not working for me. And realizing like, you don't need to sit there and argue and justify and defend and explain and do all of these things as to why what they're doing is so problematic. Like you just need to do something different. Okay. So And a uh, magpie says, yes, codependents tend to absorb narcissistic traits as a defense. Yes. And I, I think as, as like a larger picture of that, back to that drama triangle, this is that triangle, that triangle of dysfunction is all about closed off communication. And it's so people, everybody starts doing this really dysfunctional dance, trying to get their needs met. Whereas outside of the drama triangle, okay, outside of the drama triangle, people have open, honest, sincere, solutions-oriented communication. They still have fights, they still have issues, but they're brought up, they're addressed appropriately, people are still treated with dignity and respect. You know, it's okay for a person to be angry or frustrated. They're just, they're, they don't need to get loud and they don't need to be cruel. And they definitely don't need to be abusive. So there's kind of the, these ground rules for how to fight fair outside of the drama triangle, okay? Inside of the drama triangle, it's the exact opposite. So instead of that open, honest, sincere, solutions-oriented communication, you have closed, dishonest, insincere, and a power struggle type communication. That's where all of the drama comes from because nothing's getting resolved. And this is why people are like, all these, all these old issues keep coming up. Old issues don't come up. Unresolved issues do. And if you're living inside that drama triangle, it's going to be, a, it's no end to old issues and unresolved issues because nothing gets resolved because there's that closed, insincere you know, um, not solutions oriented, dishonest communication people. And it, and this, it's not just the narcissist, it, then it becomes everybody. So if, if you've got that one controlling narcissistic personality at the helm of the drama triangle, then everybody else has to kind of twist themselves into an emotional pretzel and people really, they just, it's amazing the stuff that we all, the dance that we all start dancing, not even realizing it. So if you know, most people, if you grew up in a family like this, you learn at a very young age, you, your feelings, like it's basically don't upset the narcissist. Don't upset that controlling person. 
So what do people do? They'll say they might be upset and they say that they're fine. They um, learn that their wants and needs don't matter. And so you put those on the back burner and, or that your role in the family is either you're the scapegoat or you're the golden child, or you're the, you're the peacemaker. So there's just, nobody is being authentically themselves because they can't be. The only, ironically, the only person that's even remotely close to that is the narcissist because it's all about whatever they want. You know, it's all about whatever they want. And so then everybody else just kind of bends around this really overbearing, intense personality to kind of keep the peace. But it's not keeping the peace. It's just kind of prolonging the inevitable is really what it is. And it's just, and then it just comes out in all kinds of passive aggressive or aggressive ways because the only other option, so your, your options for communication, you've got, you've got passive aggressive, passive, assertive, or aggressive. And if assertive, open, honest, sincere, solutions oriented communication is off the table, if that's not an option, then what you're left with is passive, people pleasing, being a doormat, saying yes when you mean no, the jellyfish in the jar. Passive aggressive, saying you're fine, saying that you'll do things, then calling in sick, burning somebody's dinner, slamming doors, getting quiet, withdrawing, or then you get aggressive. And that's that pent up frustration. All of a sudden now you're, you're yelling at the dog, you're yelling at the kids, you're, you know, screaming, you, you, they might even become physically violent. You know, because other people have, you know, we all need to get our needs met. But if, if the, the healthy way to get your needs met isn't an option, then people have to resort to the other three ways. But then that's, you're back in the drama triangle because nothing is getting resolved. It just brew, it just brews and brews and brews and brews and brews until it bubbles over. But then even then people still use all of those same ways of communicating and dealing with things, it's still never resolved. It just gets, the cover gets put on, you know, sort of like, just don't, don't rock the boat. Like we're all in the boat. Don't rock the boat. Just, just, we'll all look a blind eye. We'll all say that we're fine. We'll all pretend it's, they'll pretend to change and I'll pretend to believe them. And we'll all pretend that we're a happy family and it'll keep going. And it's just this dance of madness. So, okay. Missouri Cowboy says, "Uh uh-oh, I was the jellyfish in the jar. Yeah, it's a big aha moment. You know, somebody made a comment in the support group on my website a while back after we read, I think it was that Pete Walker book, after we read that book and they said, oh my God, I realized it was such a... um, eye-opening realization for them. Cause they're like, I just realized that my personality isn't my personality, that it's just been a big defense mechanism. That was just like one of the most profound things I think I've ever read. And when you realize that of, Oh my God, yeah, this is what I've been doing. This is how I've been coping with things. This is how I've like been relating to other people. And this is why it's just such a, it's just, such a huge, you know, revelation to us. But the good news is once you're, it's like anything else, you know, awareness, the first step in fixing or solving a problem is that awareness that there is one, you know, and once we realize, oh, wow, that was me. I was the jellyfish in the jar. And this is how I handled stress. And this is how I handled, you know, conflict. This is how I handled anger whether it was my own anger or somebody else's anger, like this is the way that I was handling it. And it's just so like, ding, ding, ding. Okay. That needs work. And then that needs work. And then that needs work. And you just start, you know, it's like pulling a string on a sweater, but the good news is, is we don't need to have fix everything right about ourselves, but even making a few small changes here or there, even just getting an alignment with saying yes when you mean yes and no when you mean no is a, and that's easier said than done, but that's a huge, huge step just right there. Just that piece of the puzzle or paying attention to how you feel 
learning to pay attention to how you feel because it really helps if you're in tune with that piece, then your boundaries are going to follow because you're more in tune with, hey, this isn't working for me. Instead of us kind of gaslighting ourselves and being like, no, 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 totally fine, totally workable, totally doable. They're going to change. I know, I know they're going to change. They're going to have to change because I love them. You know, instead of like slipping into that, now it's sort of like, I see things for what they are. I can anticipate what's going to happen. I'm aware that there's an issue. I can respond appropriately. Instead of being in denial, having wishful thinking, being reactive, and, and having hope be our strategy. It's just such a game changer when we start waking up to all this. Okay. Okay, let's see. Let me scroll up here. Maria is talking about kind of the difference no, with no contact and low contact for herself and says, um, he says, yeah, do what feels right for you. I just happen to abuse no contact. I would cut people off instead of advocating for myself. And I created severe isolation and rejection for myself. Okay. That's a very valid point. And I think that's something that's not talked about enough in this community is kind of the benefit or maybe not even the benefit, but like the bringing the awareness, there is such a thing as fortressing. And that's when we have really strict boundaries where so many things become deal breakers that we just start cutting people off right and left either because we don't want to be hurt or are, we're just so reactive. Like we just have been through so much. Like it was just kind of this paper thin, um, tolerance for stuff. And I think that's kind of a natural progression when people start learning boundaries. And this, this goes back to, it's a, it's, it takes a while to get your sea legs with all of this stuff. And I think a lot of people really do struggle with self-doubt and kind of wondering whether or not, you know, is this worthy of being a deal breaker or kind of where, where am I with this? Is this workable? And it's such an individual thing and only in, you know, because it's an individual thing, it's, it's up to each person, but uh, assertive communication, I think is always a good step. Uh, you know, I'd mentioned before, some of my deal breakers are like in a relationship, it's abuse, addiction, adultery, and attitude. If they have a really rotten attitude, if they're consistently negative, if they're condescending, if they're consistently critical, I'm done. Like those things are just instant deal breakers, not workable. Don't, don't, they could maybe, I don't know if they can change or not. I don't care. I'm just, it's not, I value peace in my life. So for other people that might be workable, but for me, it's not with friends. Well, and I guess with, uh, with dating too, it's, if I'm not being treated with dignity and respect, or if there's kind of disdain, if for sure, if there's disdain, contempt, or hostility, I'm out the door. I just have learned that if a person treats you that way, then they don't like you, you know, and then there's no reason to try to be friends with the person who secretly hates you. And they, how was the movie, the Wolf of Wall Street, where he said, you know, pay attention to how people are, if they cheer for your success or something like that. I think there's a lot of, a lot of truth to that. But outside of that, yeah, if somebody does something to, to um, upset you or frustrate you and it's not within your deal breakers and, um, you know, and, and if you can bring it up in an assertive way, because being assertive is really difficult. It can be very uncomfortable. It's a, a difficult, it's difficult to confront people, even in a non-confrontational way and in just saying, Hey, you know, this isn't working for me or this really hurt my feelings or, um, like, Hey, I feel like we need to talk about this or, you know, I'm concerned about X, Y, and Z or, or what have you. It's just, it's awkward. And, um, and it does take practice and I don't know. It's just all of this. There's, it just takes practice. So 
as one of the many reasons I'm a big fan of. That's a very valid point, Maria. I'll touch on that in a second here. Um, one of the reasons I'm a big fan of meetup groups, I think it's a really great way to practice these skills in a more kind of safe way because these are pe- these are total strangers. So it's a, sometimes it's a lot easier. It's not sometimes, I think all the time. It's a lot easier to practice these skills, practice paying attention to observing people and people watching and kind of watching their dynamic and watching yourself, how you you interact with them in, in a way that, that you're not emotionally invested in versus being around friends and family that you've known for 20 years. Like it's, it's kind of hard to, to start changing things up with them. So uh, there's that. And then Maria said, made the great comments. It says, yes, of the five communication styles, assertive is the least used. Very valid point. And it's really good to figure out which communication style you use most. Yes. There's so many things, right? That once it's brought to our awareness, it's just such an aha thing. So like we were talking about earlier, you know, if, because different people are comfortable with different emotions. Like some people might be more comfortable with their anger and they might go kind of default into becoming aggressive. Some people might really be uncomfortable with their anger or the anger of other people and they become very passive. And some people are kind of somewhere, I think a lot of people confuse passive aggressive with being assertive. And they're like, well, you know what? My son didn't do the dishes and I'm going to teach him. I'm just going to throw every single plate in this house out. And they, they think that that's being assertive or that's laying down the law. And it's not, that's being at a minimum, that's being passive aggressive. I think you could make the argument that's also being aggressive, but it's not addressing the issue, right? So kind of like learning what it actually looks like to actually address the issue. Because, and then, you know, boundaries are important and, you know, boundaries actually have, a real boundary actually has a consequence instead of just threatening and threatening and threatening and threatening. Or it's not even involves threatening really, but like telling, reminding a person over and over and over again. Like it's just, there's consequences. But yeah, great, great point. Um, Gigi, Gigi, Gigi says, share, I'm sharing again in case it was missed. Something about a new podcast series about boundaries includes discussions about assertiveness. Is this a podcast or is this something that you want me to do podcasts on or... Uh, I mean, we could do both, <laughs> but I, that's cool. If there's another podcast out there, uh, let's see. Jennifer says, I'm very bad with assertiveness and I'm very uncomfortable with being angry, but it's part of one of my goals to work on. I just don't know how that's a really insightful comment. And I, I think a lot of people share that they feel the same way. It's difficult to be assertive. I think it's because we're being honest. It's difficult to be honest because then we're kind of, you're, you know, you're risking rejection. You're risking another person it's being kind of open and honest with that message that you, ha- that communication that you want to convey to them. And then how are they, there's kind of an unknown wild card of how they're going to respond to it. It's a lot easier you know, it's a lot easier to, to tell your mom or your parents, Hey, you know what? I don't feel good and fake a headache to get out of the house instead of just saying like, this isn't really stressful for me and I can't be here anymore or it's difficult. So yeah, you know, it's difficult. So, um, the book that we're going to be discussing tomorrow, we're just kind of FYI book club tomorrow is on the book, emotional blackmail uh, by what do I say? Susan F- Forward, I think. Elizabeth, oh God. I think the last names are Frazier and Forward, is the book that we're going to be discussing. And uh, one of the concepts that she talks about in there, which I really love, is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
when it comes to emotions. And another part in the book, and we'll go into this more tomorrow, but she says, um, we tend to tell ourselves our kind of maybe subconscious, like default statement is I can't handle this. I can't stand this because it's all of this, this pressure from manipulative people or just uncomfortable situations and developing the new mantra of I can stand this. And then slowing things down and just getting grounded and getting centered and getting, giving yourself some space and time. So you're not kind of in this like knee jerk reaction to respond or to react to them. If they're putting you in an uncomfortable position where you feel pressured to say yes, or you feel pressured to kind of give in or, or kind of go along with them. Like it can just give you some space and realizing I, I can't, I can stand this. I can stand it. I'm going to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. going to take a few breaths and just regroup and then go at it again, you know, in a, in a healthy boundary clad assertive way. Uh, she says, I'm very uncomfortable with being angry. So that part too is, um, I think there's a lot of us that are uncomfortable, that are very out of tune with our anger. I hear time and time again from people after they've gone through relationships like this, they tend to go one of two ways. Either they become so full of rage that they can't even handle it, or they become completely numb. And the good thing with anger is that there's energy in that. But if a person's not used to handling their anger, it can be really scary. I, when I was going through this, I was, I had never experienced rage like that in my whole life. And it seriously just felt like somebody turned on this fire hose and it was just going everywhere. And I just thought, oh my God, I like, I don't need, I'm scared of what I'm capable of because I just had, I had no experience ever feeling that way before. So it can be really scary at a, at an extreme level after a person's fresh out of a relationship like this, or even on a more mild level of just being angry. And uh, so, yeah, it takes some practice to get in tune with our anger and realize that it's okay to be angry. You know, anger, anger is emotion. It's a valid emotion, just like any other emotion that we experience and that we can timers going off. It's in how we express that anger that makes all the difference. And, and so I think kind of developing, coming up with some different ways that you can do that. Okay, what can I do when I get angry? I could go take a kickboxing class. I could go shut my door and scream. I could go in my car and scream. I could journal. I could go for a run. I could do 40 jumping jacks. I could getting that anger out and then to where you can become more responsive instead of becoming reactive. And again, this stuff takes practice too, because we, I think most people, right? Like we're used to just responding. Somebody does something, we get upset or we shut down or we eat or we spend money or we drink or however that comes out, however we're coping with things, it, we have to kind of interrupt that pattern and then start doing something different. So, and that just takes, it takes time and it takes practice. And James says, I think I was more numb. I just didn't know it at the time. Yeah. Uh, Tom asks, hi, Dana, have you done a book club yet on Richard Granin's book, how to get revenge on a narcissist? You know, I don't think I have that. I read that book a while ago. We can definitely add it to the list. If you'd like to discuss that, I think we've got like five, four or five open spots. I, I did want to reserve some of the spots for PMLity 
because she is fantastic. And I, she'd kind of slipped off my radar until somebody had mentioned her in a comment well, like a month or so ago. So I thought that would be really, she's all about inner child stuff, but yeah, if you've got ideas for book club stuff, um, you know, let me know and we can work on that. Okay. Let me, That's very true. And Jennifer says, I think the lack of anger also comes from a narcissist justifying their behavior so much that we believe we're wrong for being angry. So I don't want to overreact. Yes. I think you nailed it. I think that's very common when a person's continually told, Hey, you're just being overly emotional. You're too sensitive, too sensitive. That didn't happen. Um, <sighs> you know, or getting blamed. This is really your fault. I don't know why you're upset. If you should be upset with anybody, it should be you kind of a thing where there's just zero accountability on their end, you know? So I, it's okay to feel how you feel. You feel how you feel, you know, it's not an overreaction especially if you've been emotionally abused, it's definitely not an overreaction. And you know what, even if it, maybe if it makes you feel better right now, if your brain is still fighting that thinking like maybe it is an overreaction and like, I don't really know to just be like, okay, even if it is an overreaction, I still feel how I feel. And I'm still going to express that. Like you can still go to a kickboxing class or scream into your, or punch your pillow or scream as loud as you can in your car or jam out to some really intense music or, you know what I mean? Like you can still get that energy out of your system in whatever way that's health, you know, healthy for you. Um, even if it is an overreaction. So I, I don't try to maybe kind of just bypass that part in your brain. That's wanting to keep that down and just focus on getting that energy out. It really does help to just very cathartic to just get that out. So, okay. Let me scroll up here real quick and then we'll. And Maria was saying, oh, there's an earlier part to this. That she cut people off when she couldn't take the exploitation anymore, but I needed, she says, I needed to stay and say no and say enough and balance things out. I was so scared of that and terrified. I think it just depends on the situation because I totally get that, like a person needing to just assert themselves and, and hold their ground and say their piece. But I think it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's, Sometimes it's just knowing, knowing when to hold them, knowing when to fold them, know when to walk away and know when to run. And I think if just depending on the situation, if it's just going to be screaming into the wind and that person's going to continue to just make your life a living hell, I think certain situations I think are worth addressing and worth kind of holding your ground. And some of them are just, it's just not. But it's, an, it's such an individual thing, but it's definitely, I get what you're saying. And I think it's a very important skill to be able to just say, hey, this is not okay with me. And this is not working for me. And kind of like knowing, knowing when to do one of those things, know when to hold them, when to fold them, when to walk away, when to run, you know, and that takes time and it takes practice. But yeah, really, really great comments and insights. So, okay. Bonnie says, my mother cries when you try to set a boundary. 
Yeah. Oh, we're going to discuss so much of this stuff tomorrow <laughs> with this book, Emotional Blackmail. I love um, her concept, the the term emotional blackmail, because she goes into that and she really says, you know, a blackmail, it takes two people. And I refer to the similar concept as emotional terrorism. So it's either you give me what I want or, or else, right? I'm going to start crying. I'm going to threaten suicide. I'm going to threaten you. I'm going to make you pay. It's emotional terrorism. And I'm a big fan of not negotiating with emotional terrorists. So, cause they try to hold you hostage, you know, either you call me back or you do what I want, or I'm going to hurt myself. Don't make me do it. And it's sort of like, no, we're not doing it. Like, if you do that, that's your choice, but I'm not buying into that. I'm not doing that. And it's hard to break that cycle, especially when you've got a person crying, right. Or threatening suicide or doing these major things. It's like, Oh my God, I feel like a monster if I say no to them. And, but in the, and so her concept is a, you know, blackmail takes two, it takes the blackmailer and it takes the person that's being black. The person that's being blackmailed has to go along with it. So if we want to stop being blackmailed, we have to stop buying into the blackmail. And that is really hard to do. And we have to, it goes back to, we have to getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and realizing, okay, I need to be able to somehow sit here and tolerate or do something different if my mom calls me crying because I won't do what she wants. How am I going to handle that? So if I, if I want the situation to change, I can only change my response to it. And if we quit buying into being blackmailed, they're going to have to switch tactics, but then being prepared for that. And then eventually if they just realize, Hey, none of these tactics are working, all of the, the guilt and the fear and the obligation and the shame and the sympathy and the pity and, you know, all of this isn't working. Well, then I guess I'm just going to have to go somewhere else and try my game on somebody else. Cause it's not working with her people. They do tend to learn pretty quickly, like what works and what doesn't work. So yeah. And Gigi says, yeah, I describe narcissists as emotional terrorists because they do not follow the rules of healthy emotions and interactions. Yes. It's all about a power struggle. I mean, that's the main difference, you know, a, a normal relationship, especially a healthy relationship, it's teamwork. It's a three-legged race. It's, you got to work as a team or it's not going to work with a narcissist. It's only ever a power struggle and they are always trying to get their way by any means necessary. She touches on, we not touches, the whole book is based on this. So we'll be talking about this a lot more in depth tomorrow. So book club tomorrow, 6.30 PM Eastern standard time. I hope you guys can make it. So let's um, kind of take some time to just get grounded in the moment. And we'll do a kind of a guided imagery thing, and then we'll call it a night for tonight. Yes. Maria says, yes, you summed that up so well. She says, yes, learning when to use no contact, low contact and full contact. That's the skills. When to use, when to use, which leads one to a full life. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So with that said, let's take a moment and just get comfortable, whatever oh, that might look like for you. If you're sitting down, allow yourself to just get comfortable in your chair. Oh, my neck. And if you're laying down, allow yourself to just kind of sink in to your bed or your couch, wherever you are. <sighs> Taking in some deep breaths in through your nose. And out through your mouth. Thank you. 
turning inward and allowing yourself to be fully present in this moment. Realizing that it's okay if you're carrying any stress, or tension, or anxiety, worry, any of that, that you can take it right now and just visualize it as like a ball and that you're just going to set it down next to you, that it's still there, that you can choose to pick it up again at any time, but that it's okay to set it down right now. And that right now for the next 10 minutes or so, we're just going to be here in the moment. We're just going to be still. We're just going to breathe. Realizing that you are not the anxiety or the worry or the stress. That you exist at a deeper level than that. That there is stillness deep inside of you below all of those other emotions. And that it's okay for you to just set them down from time to time. So now bringing your attention and your awareness to the top of your head, kind of slowly doing a scan for any residual kind of muscle tension that might be present. Slowly relaxing your forehead, relaxing your eyes, Relaxing your cheeks, relaxing the back of your head and your mouth, allowing your mouth to fall open and letting your tongue fall from the roof of your mouth. Feeling what it feels like to relax your jaw, just relax your face completely. Noticing any areas that you do tend to store any tension in your head and in your face and letting those go. Relaxing your neck, your shoulders, maybe rolling them backwards or allowing them just to fall open. Noticing if your shoulders drop as you release the tension. I think so often we tend to kind of go through our day, with our shoulders up to our ears, just letting them drop, letting your arms get heavy, letting your hands just relax and fall in whatever position is the most comfortable. Relaxing your chest. Relaxing your stomach. Relaxing your hips. And allowing your legs to fall in whatever position is the most comfortable for you. Remembering to breathe in through your nose. and out through your mouth. And bringing your attention back to your legs, your thighs, your knees, your calves, relaxing your feet, Relaxing your toes, letting your body just get heavy as it fully relaxes and releases any residual tension or pain or anxiety. And continuing to breathe, 
in through your nose and out through your mouth. Allowing each breath that you take to go deeper and deeper. Bringing awareness to any shallow breathing that you might have, very common. We all tend to kind of get so busy with life that we take very quick hurried breaths. So practice bringing your, bringing that air down into like the bases, base of your lungs. Visualize it going down into your stomach. Nice, deep cleansing breath. Now let's take the next seven breaths and with each breath in, I'd like for you to visualize a white kind of silver cleansing, restorative light that you breathe in with each inhale. And with each exhale, focus on exhaling any residual stress, pain, or anxiety. Visualize that as some sort of shade of gray or black. It's interesting to kind of watch what your mind comes up with. So the darker the color, perhaps the more intense the anxiety, the pain or the stress. So you're breathing in with a nice clear, clean white light and you're exhaling kind of almost like a car exhaust that gray color. And let's keep doing that. We're gonna do that for seven breaths. And the goal is by the end of the seventh breath that we're breathing in white light and we're exhaling white light. So we're just kind of a clear vessel. <laughs> okay, so let's start. Let's breathe in. And exhale. Now that you're feeling that cleansing, restorative white light moving all through you, let's take some time and visualize going out to different people, either here in the chat, people online, people in your everyday life. Visualize kind of giving them a big energetic hug 
sharing some of that good, clean energy with them. Taking time, turning inward, feeling that energy, that good, clean energy as it kind of connects you to everything else that's good and right with the world. Feeling that energy as it's pulsing in your body. Turning your attention to your hands, feeling them pulse. Maybe even they're getting warm. Bringing your attention down into your feet. See if you can feel them kind of tingling with that energy as it just moves so perfectly and effortlessly throughout your body. Moving in and around every single cell in your body, restoring it, rebuilding it, helping you heal, getting in tune with yourself, knowing that you know you have all the answers within you, that you know how something feels when it feels right for you, when it feels nourishing for you, that you know how something feels when it feels off or toxic for you, that you have the power, you have the knowledge to get yourself into that alignment, into that healthy alignment. And that you matter. And that you are healing in both big and small ways every single moment of every single day. And when you're ready, coming back, making sure that you give yourself a really big energetic hug just letting yourself know that you love and accept yourself completely. That you love and accept yourself completely. That there is so much that is right about you. And that you trust the process for healing. And when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes and come on back.
People are talking about ASMR. ASMR is such an interesting thing, isn't it? I think diff different sounds and videos work for different people. Um, I, I almost kind of think you need to try a handful of different ones to see which ones resonate the most with you. I personally have found some of the, at first I thought some of these videos are so strange and I had a really hard time getting into them. But then when I allowed myself to just kind of put my judgment, I guess, aside and just kind of go with it, that I found some of the, there's one video where this person has this palette of oil paints and they're just mixing them. And it's the sound of a palette knife in oil paint mixing colors. And it's, that's like so relaxing to me. <laughs> so I don't know. Like sometimes I think you just have to try a few and kind of see uh, I will say if you're, if you like just watching videos that are relaxing, one of my favorite channels that is like super Zen is a guy, his channel is called primitive technology. And it's this guy, I don't know where he is, New Zealand, Australia, I think out in the middle of nowhere. And he just is out in nature by himself with the camera and he makes things, amazing things. He might make, uh, oh, um, he digs up clay and he makes, uh, did it mm -hmm. one of the tile roof. He made tiles and built a kiln and mm -hmm. the whole thing. And then another video, I mean, he just is so clever. <laughs> I could just watch that guy all day long. It's just so relaxing to hear the sounds of nature and just to kind of watch this other person do these amazing things. It's, I don't know, super Zen. He's worth checking out. Um, so when the narc barks, can you message me your, is your name the same on there? So let's go from there or actually try um, joining. There's, we have another group. It's the 365 I Thrive. And that group is more about kind of the next stage in all of this. It's more about like boundaries and healing and inner child and all of that kind of stuff. So the focus is 100% on us. Mm -hmm. So send that request there. So yes, kitties are cute. Thank you for reminding me. He says, I can't remember, but isn't your book start here going to be free for a short while in April? Yes. April 1st It's going, that book is the ebook is going to be free. So I will mention that again tomorrow night. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, it's a group. When the narc barks ass is a group. Yes, it's called 365 I Thrive. That's weird that you can't even find that group. Then I I'll have to dig into it. It's a group. But I don't know why you wouldn't I don't know. I'll have to look into it. Every time Facebook does updates, things get glitchy. And so sometimes that happens. I, nothing comes to the top of my head as to why as to an issue. So I'll have to I'll have to dig and figure it out. So oh that's such an Nancy says I love the sound of a crackling fire on a candle wick. I do too. Love that. They have those videos of a, just a fireplace, you know, and, uh, super relaxing. I I'm with you. That's such a great sound. Okay, guys. So with all of that said, thank you so much for being here tonight. I hope to see you tomorrow for book club, 6 30 PM Eastern standard time. And we will go from there. So as always, 
Thank you so much for being here. And you are not alone. You are not crazy. And you really can move forward and heal from this. So take care and have a fantastic night. Good night. Mm -hmm.